Salem, Massachusetts. In 1692, 20 young women were tried and executed for practicing witchcraft. Now, 200 years later, more than 400 women practice the black arts of sorcery. Why? And especially, why here? I'm Leonard Nimoy, in search of Salem Witches. Welcome to the Cinematic Void Podcast. Cinematic Void is a cult film series that hosts screenings in the Los Angeles area as well as virtually. I'm your host, Jim Branscombe, and joining me as always is... Hey, it's Nick Vance, Paranoid Futures on all social media platforms. You can find Cinematic Void on the World Wide Web at cinematicvoid.com, as well as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and all major podcast platforms. If you want to support The Void, consider joining our Patreon. Not only do you get cool perks, but you make this podcast as well as the Cinemadness movie possible. So, Jim, how is Crypticon? It's pretty cool. And, you know, it's a different experience because, like, I've never been a guest to a convention, so it was kind of hilarious to have a name tag or a lanyard that said celebrity on it, which is, come on now, I ain't famous. But I would say the staff of Crypticon were really awesome. I got treated really well. All the panels I did were really cool. The Cinematist movie Live, it did pretty good. It wasn't a big crowd. I honestly thought I might have one person showing up for it, but it was like close to round 20, which is, I'm, I take that as a victory, especially for being in a place where like no one knows who the fuck I am. I got thrown a Q&A with Terry Kaiser, who's best known as Bernie from Weekend at Bernie's last minute, and that was pretty cool too. Nice, hell yeah. Um, I was trying to get him to talk about some weird shit, but um, actually he did bring up Tammy and the T-Rex, so I didn't have to bring it up, but like... Just trying to get him to talk about Surf too, and he's like, I don't remember doing that movie. Hey, but he was a nice guy and it was a really cool QA. Um I don't know at the time at the time we were recording this, it's not posted online, but it should be posted at some point in the next week or two. So I'll probably repost that if you want to catch my QA with Terry Kaiser, aka Bernie, aka is the other bad guy in Friday the thirteenth, part seven, aka is the villain in Tammy and T Rex, as well as Mannequin on the Move. But, you know, besides Crypticon. Also, I had the first Cinematic Void screening in the theater since our last episode, because the last episode was promoting and talking about all those things. So I, I think it'd be fair, before we get into the nitty-gritty of this episode, to kind of recap all that stuff. So, start kicked off Cinematic Void with doing Cobra, Glorious 35mm. That was the first Void in 18 months or something like that. You were there, and what were your thoughts on that event? It was, it was a lot of fun, man. Um, the whole crowd was, the crowd was electric. The cloud, the crowd was electric. <laughs> but really, everybody seemed super stoked. You were up there screaming on stage. I was screaming like I was <laughs> fucking Bruce Dickinson or something like that. You know, it was weird because when I went up and did my intro, after I got done, I had no recollection of any words that came out of my mouth. I'm glad it was videotaped and we also did an Instagram live for those of you who couldn't attend in person. So it's like, it was kind of nice to go back. It's like, okay, it was coherent. When I posted it, like someone... I, someone mentioned in a comment that like, ah, you had leads, you had like front man energy when you're on the stage. I'm like, yeah, I guess I did. There you go. Not trying to be egotistical, but like years of being in punk bands and being lead vocalist or whatever has paid off in introducing films. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm sure you can relate to when playing shows, sometimes getting off stage and being like, fuck, I don't remember any of that. Oh, definitely. Like I, usually the best shows, I have no recollection of playing. Occasionally you, I would have moments or stuff, and then that's not because I was drunk out of my mind or anything playing these shows, because I had plenty of bad shows where I was drunk out of my mind and vividly remembered them. But, like, I don't know, it, it was really cool to do that again. And, you know, as we're recording this, like, the, this episode is going to come out before after these shows have already happened, but, like, coming up and doing Terror Train on September 10th, as well as Alphabet City on the 17th, and that's going to be with Vincent Spano and a video intro from Amos Poe, who's the director of Alphabet City. And I'm really excited for those shows. I don't want to pretend and say, like, oh, they were great, and, and you know, <laughs> since we're recording before they happen, but, like, people seem stoked for both of them, and I'm, I'm really happy people seem stoked for Alphabet City because that, to me, is a little bit of a programming gamble because it's a, it's a really cool movie. It's from the 80s, but it's not on everyone's radar, which is a perfect Void movie, but... Is it too soon to get that deep cutty? I'm going to find out, I guess. Let's get to the topic at hand, because this is an episode that at least I've been plugging, and by default you've been plugging, because you know, you're know you on the podcast too, for quite a bit. And this is an episode about one of my favorite places to visit, be at whatever, Salem, Massachusetts. 
And the reason why I want to do this episode is because we're coming up on Halloween season here. And last year we did a long on Halloween bit. It was four episodes where we talked about movies that took place on Halloween. And it's just, what can we do is a little bit different. That's still horror related, Halloween related, but not necessarily a retread of what we already did. So I thought Salem, Massachusetts is a perfect topic because, you know, obviously there's the witch trials and surprise, no real witches were ever involved in those witch trials. But Salem now is filled with like tons of practicing witches is probably one of the, I don't want to say number one, but it's probably close to number one Halloween destination. I've been going to Salem pretty regularly since 2003 and not as much in this last decade from 2010 on. It's been more spotty, but like I've been a bunch of times and I really love it there, even though it's getting a little more packed and all that. So I thought it'd be fun to do an episode about it because there's been movies based on and shot there that we can talk about. And what I did is I assembled a panel of guests and I'm going to state this right off the bat that all these interviews were recorded between May and July of this year. So if you'll notice a lot of people are talking very hopeful about the end of the pandemic, it's not because they're assholes and like delusional what's going on in Delta variant and all that stuff. It's just because when we recorded it, like that stuff wasn't really on the radar. So if you hear that optimism, it's not because ignorance. It's just because when we recorded it, it wasn't relevant. So Bear that in mind, but um, it was a real pleasure to talk to all these people that I had on, or talked to over the last several months, including Kay Lynch, who is the founder and runs Salem Horror Fest, which is kind of the, let's say, East Coast equivalent of sort of Beyond Fest, show a lot of the same stuff we do. Also, Rachel Christ from the Salem Witch Museum, who was very kind enough to talk about a very strange movie shot in Salem. James Lurgio, who runs Count Orlock's Nightmare Gallery, which is one of the best horror museums out there. And also talked to YouTube vlogger Derek Millen of Detours, who basically put himself on the map by doing some really fun, informative, you know, vlogs about Salem, which is why I had him on. So we're going to take a little break here and we're going to talk a little bit more about which city after these messages. Salem, Massachusetts. Legend has it that witches weren't very welcome here in the old days. But things change. This summer, a pretty witch named Samantha went to Salem and got a very warm welcome. Action. Camera. Lights. Extras. Salem will be the background for several episodes of The Witch this season. Nobody knew how the townspeople would take to an invading army of show business professionals, but everybody got together with the cast and crew right away. Why don't you get together with Elizabeth Montgomery and the Bewitch Gang this fall on ABC? Welcome back. We are going to be talking about Salem, Massachusetts and the Halloween season here on the Cinematic Boy Podcast. And I guess my first question for you, Nick, is have you ever been to Salem? I have never been to Salem. Um, I've always wanted to, but I've just never, it's just never even been close to there on tour. So never been there. But you definitely play Boston in places like that. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because like I... You know, I don't think Salem's like a tour spot. I know they have venues, and I know there's punk and metal bands that actually play there now. Probably not when you and I were in the throes of our punk and hardcore and metal like touring era. Definitely played Boston a few times, and Boston is you know pretty well known for a very vibrant hardcore scene. A lot of proto grindcore bands came from there, such as Siege and Deep Wound, and a lot of indie rock and Anal Cunt. Anal Cunt, yeah. Let's always mention anal cunt. I mean, we're talking about the area. That's true. Gotta, it's a highlight. It's a highlight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure all the people from Boston <laughs> want, love that anal cunt as a highlight of their musical pedigree. But, you know, there's a bunch of noise rock bands that came from there, too. Like, well, you know, Deep Womb eventually became Dinosaur Jr. and things like that. Pixies are from there. So, vibrant mu- music scene. But, like... Salem's a little different, and um, there's a town close to where you and I lived in Maryland called Habity Grace, which I know you're familiar with, 
which is a little quaint seaside town. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's cobblestones and stuff like that. It's on the water. And Salem's a town like that. But I don't know. There's just something about Salem. And, like, again, the way Salem has sold itself or reinvented itself as, like, this Halloween destination is definitely not how it wanted to be for many years. And we're going to get into that as we talk to different guests throughout this episode. But I should go into, like, the first time I went to Salem for a vacation. Went to, with my friend Jim DeHaven, and who you heard his name dropped quite a bit on the Bruce Holchek episode, and his cousin Nick. We went in 2003. That was the first time I went, and, you know, it was, like, maybe the week before Halloween and stuff. And we were there on a weekend, and, like, it was nuts. And this is in 2003, and, like, but we had a lot of fun. And, like, we did all the cool museums. We did all the, like cheap shit like rip off museums you know ran around drank all that fun stuff it's like the uh, mardi gras of halloween it it does get mardi gras-ish just like maybe not people flashing each other i mean the the thing about salem on halloween which i ended up doing the following year in 2004 is like it is a madhouse it is so many fucking people people dressed in costumes a lot of good ones a lot of shit ones you know First time I went on Halloween, we didn't dress up, and, like, that's kind of a regret. Yeah. But, I mean, the, the 2004 was the year that Boston, I don't know, for those of you who like baseball, that was the year Boston broke their curse and won their first, like, World Series in, like, what, 100 years or something like that? Yeah. So, like, 90% of the people in Salem on Halloween were dressed like Boston baseball players. Like, the big one was Johnny Damon, who had, like, long hair and a beard, so there's, like, all kinds of people dressed like that. And it was insane. And when we went, it was just like, it's just so many people, so much going on. And then, but this is a thing for those of you who've been to New England or grew up in New England, they close shit at early. Yeah. Like ridiculous early. Like Dunkin' Donuts is fucking closed at like nine or something <laughs> like that. But Salem shuts down at 10 p.m. without fail on Halloween. And then they start ushering people out. And in 2004, we were, this is again, DeHaven, his cousin Nick and I, we were, we were parked in the parking garage and we we're like trying to get out of town, except like they have a lot of the main roads closed. Now, normally this wouldn't be a problem, but this is pre-GPS, so all we had was MapQuest directions. Like, is it printed out? On yeah, we, <laughs> all we had printed yeah. out MapQuest directions. <laughs> like, I mean, you and I have definitely done tours oh, yeah. of that shit. And, like, the thing about MapQuest directions, there's always one direction that isn't quite accurate or it's too vague. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to bring this up. Um, I was on tour with one of the bands I was in, and we were in Indiana, and, like, we couldn't find this fucking road. And the reason why we couldn't find it is because it was part of this freeway, and it was, like, a convergence of three different highways. So it was all the same road, but you didn't know that because it only listed one road. So, like... I don't know, it's confusing. It's just saying, like, turn right onto this, but there's no fucking right. Yeah, exactly, because, like, it's not clear. So, I've told this story before, and it's like a bit of folklore. So, if anyone has known me, you've probably heard this story. I know you've heard this story probably too many fucking times at this point. And um, many years ago, I actually included, when I used to do a zine called Chalk Outline, I actually wrote out this story. There's actually two stories to it. Um, I'll tell the other one, fuck it. So, the, the year that... We all went to Salem on Halloween for the first time. We stayed at this hotel that was like maybe a half hour outside of Salem. Because that was the thing. Like all the big hotels, like the Hawthorne Hotel, which is like an incredible hotel, which, spoiler, I'm actually going to Salem in April next year. Like the 21st through the 24th, something like that. And I'm checking off my bucket list of actually staying at the Hawthorne Hotel. It's off season, so it's cheap. But like during... You know, Halloween, it's like impossible to get because people book it every year and they get priority to rebook if they want to come back. Oh, shit. So it's hard. And it's also like it's very pricey. But, you know, Salem's economy is based on like month, one month, really two months because it starts in September. October is the bigger month. And I think now it actually carries over a little bit until November now. So, like, they've extended their like Halloween spooky season thing. But at the time, we were staying in this hotel. It was like, I think it was a Westin or something like that. And it was like, the reason we were staying there, because the original hotel we used to stay at, we used to stay at this fucking scummy, like, Days Inn that was in Danvers. And I should point out, Danvers used to be part of, like, Salem 
there's like the town of Salem and then there's like the city of Salem. I know I'm getting this wrong, but like the funny thing is most of the witch trial stuff took place in Danvers as opposed to Salem proper. All the trials took place in Salem proper, but like all the accusations and stuff was really Danvers that used to be part of Salem. Okay. But anyway, so we couldn't stay at this days in because we booked too late, which is why when we started going once a year, we started booking like over a year in advance, which is kind of what you have to do. And so we were staying at this different hotel and we left home from Maryland. So it's about a seven hour drive up to Salem, which when you tour in a van, you usually break it up because you usually play like either Philadelphia or New Jersey on your way up and you don't have to do the full seven hours. So we'd always get up like three or four in the morning to make this trek because you didn't want to hit New York during rush hour mm-hmm. and the George Washington Bridge. The joke is, it didn't matter what time of day you hit the George Washington Bridge. It was always like gridlock rush hour. Yeah. But anyway, so we left early. We get to this hotel. And we're like, hey, can we check in just to get a couple, cop some Z's before we're like we head into town? They're like, oh, your hotel, uh, your room's not going to be ready until 3. Which is, a, you know, that's a normal hotel policy. But, like, I think both of us have been to hotels that just let you check in as soon as you show up. Yeah, it's like, dude, I've been driving all day. Let's go. But the problem is it's it's... It's 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 Halloween season in Salem, so there's people that are gonna like check out right at their checkout time where they paid to get like an extended checkout or whatever. And they said, We'll work on getting your room. Just go wait in the like they had like a restaurant lobby area. So we go in there and we're like fucking dead tired. And I remember this commercial because it played like multiple times while we were waiting, and it was like this bagel commercial, and there's this dude with this thick Boston accent going, Cut the cops. Like, just yelling this shit, because he's saying, like, his New York bagels were better than other New York bagels, but you have a Boston accent, whatever. I've tried for the life of me to find this fucking commercial on YouTube, <laughs> so I wanted to use it for the Cinematis movie, because it's just insanity. But we're waiting in this lobby, hoping to get into our room early, and there's, like, a reception going on. It was, like, some... It was, like, some couple's, like, maybe 50th wedding anniversary, and... One of their sons was throwing a shit fit because, like, they requested five tables with, I think, eight to a table or something like that. But instead, they set up four tables and put ten at a table. I know I'm not probably doing the numbers right and I'm not worried about it, but, like, either way, it was the same amount of people could sit at less tables. They get in this argument with this poor Pakistani guy who's, like, just trying to do his job. And it was getting racist. And the guy fucking just starts yelling at him, like the people like being racist to him. Was like, show me respect. And it was just like the most awesome thing because he put him in his place, made him feel bad. But then he went and got the other table anyway. But he made him feel like shit for being dicks. But anyway, that was the first part of it. The second part was leaving Salem that night. And like, we're leaving the main parking garage in the town. And I remember one vivid image that I'll never forget is like, there was this girl that looked dead that the police are picking up off the sidewalk. Like she looked pale white and she's dressed as an angel. It's like some like symbolic horror movie shit going on. Like she obviously like fucking had alcohol poisoning or something. Shit. And that's what that's what we saw as we're trying to get out of town. And then we're following this detour. We have map quest. So it's like we're hoping to find the road that we need to get back to get back to the hotel. And we get cut off at some point because there's lots of confusion and we get lost. And we're just driving on these roads, not knowing where the fuck we're going. We're like, how are we going to find the highway? How are we going to find our hotel? So we eventually find this random grocery store that was getting ready to close. And we go in trying to find, playing, hey, mister, or hey, anyone, really, can you help us get to the freeway? And there's this guy that's like completely reeking of gin walking around with a loaf of bread. And we're like, hey, sir, can you help us get the freeway? He's like, yeah, yeah, I can help you get it. Let me just buy my bread. Some lady comes up and is like, sir, we're getting ready to close. He's like, I know, I know. I'm just going to buy my goddamn bread, just yelling. So we go wait for this guy outside. And he comes out with his goddamn bread. And he's like, it, he was like, it's kind of hard for me to explain how to get to the freeway. So you can follow me and I'll get you there. Okay. I've seen this movie. Yeah, I, I've seen this movie too. <laughs> and But what other choice we have. It's like, I don't know how to get back. Gas stations were starting to close because it's fucking weird. New England, like curfew. I don't, 
If someone's from New England that's listening to it, please explain to me the weird 10 o'clock shutdown. Because, like, I played Rhode Island. Same shit. Mm-hmm. Like, all, all of it's like this. So, I don't know. Anyway, so we're following this dude with this loaf of bread that reeked of gin. And, cool, maybe we're really close to the highway. It's not going to take that long. We start going out in the woods. Like, pitch black. No street lights or nothing, like, in the woods. And, like, we were all, like, sitting there thinking, like, we're, he's going to fucking stop and he's going to fucking kill us. Like, that was a big thing, but it's like, well, what other option do we have? It's either he murders us or we get back to the freeway. Turns out he got us to the freeway. <laughs> but he stopped and pulled over. And super nice guy, drunk as shit, probably shouldn't have been driving, whatever. And he's like, hey, you got Maryland plates. You guys fr- fans of the Baltimore Orioles? Like, the Haven is cousin said yes i don't watch baseball don't know fuck all over other than billy ripkin and his fuck face bat that's my baseball knowledge and then he's like hey i used to be in a band that played a lot back in the day and we played baltimore a few times and really enjoyed it you might have heard of us and i was like yeah maybe you do look kind of familiar but couldn't really place them but we get back to the freeway and he kept talking about rotaries and we're like, what's a rotary? We just assumed it was like a New England term for a traffic circle, which it is, but it isn't. A rotary is a series of like at least three traffic circles that you have to weave in and out of to get to where you need to go. And it's just like still not knowing where you're going and people like just driving nuts and all that. But we made it back to our hotel. And funny enough, they had some heavy metal band playing in the bar. Like maybe not even heavy metal, maybe actual death metal band because it was like long hairs and fucking like leather jackets and spikes and shit. I don't know if, I think we thought about watching it, but then we were just like, I'm tired. Let's just go to bed. It it was a long day. It was a weird day. Q, maybe a week later, after the Salem trip, I get back. I won a record off of eBay. It was this bolt thrower record in battle. There's no law. And the person had packed it, the record in a sleeve of another record to protect it. I get the sleeve and it's a solo record by Art Garfunkel. And I look, and I stop, and I look, and then I had the holy shit moment. The dude that helped us was Art Garfunkel. <laughs> <laughs> Not joking. I can't, I can't say if it was actually Art Garfunkel, but he said he was in a big band, played Baltimore, looked like the dude. I don't think Art Garfunkel has like a really thick New England accent. I don't know. I barely have heard him talk other than like being in Nicholas Rogue's um, Bad Timing and Mike Nichols' um, Carnal Knowledge. Mm-hmm. But he might have an acting coach. So this is a story I stick with. That Ark Garfunkel with his loaf of bread and reeking of gin got us to the highway and saved the day. So Art, if you're listening. Don't sue us. And... After I've wasted everyone's time telling this ridiculous story, but like it, it's a story I've told enough times that like people like actually bring it up like as real like folklore at some point. So, you know, tell the legend and that's the legend. But, you know, since 2004, I basically went to Salem every year through until like 2008 and then 2009, I moved out here. Then 2010, I went again before my wife and I got married. And then we went again in 2016, 17, 18. When we went 18, we went on Halloween again. And like I dressed as Dr. Fives and all that. Was that uh, was that like right after the time you did it for the Cinematheque? Yeah. Yep. It was like basically I already had the... Co- Here's the funny thing. I already had the costume planned out. And then I got offered to do Dr. Fives screening. So oh, okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm asking. Like, which kind of which came first? The the Fives costume was coming anyway. Oh, no shit. That's awesome. So it just kind of worked out. It's like, fuck it. I might as well just test it out anyway. Yeah. Which was really cool. And the one thing I learned about dressing as Dr. Fives on Halloween is people knew who he was, but a lot of people didn't. And his costume in that first Dr. Fives movie is all white. So I was getting dirty looks. And You're looking like Colonel Sanders. Looking like Colonel Sanders or a fucking Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan or something. Because, like, I was getting looks of people, like... Because it's like, I'm pale white, dressed all white, white shoes, white everything with a fucking cape. Like, I definitely was getting, like, death stares. And I was like, man, 
I'm Dr. Fives. I'm not like a fucking like clans member or anything like that. But white, white shoes, white hat, Cadillac. <laughs> no no white hat though. But boys of time bomb. <laughs> <laughs> fucking rancid <laughs> reference. Jesus Christ, man. But that was the last time I went to Salmo Halloween. And like I really love going there. Like it it's a really small town, like in, you know, a lot of the museums, there's a lot of tourist traps, but it's a really cool vibe, and it's something I enjoy, which is part of the reason why I'm going back in April off-season, just to kind of go explore and enjoy, because there's a lot of things that you end up not doing, because you're contained in just that one area. But... Is there know, a theater there? There is. There's Cinema Salem's there, and it just reopened this year, Sick. which kind of leads into our first guest that will that I did an interview with coming up here, which is Kay Lynch, who runs Salem Horror Fest. I had the pleasure of talking to her back on May 20th, 2021. She was the first one to agree and like do this interview. And it was like really cool. We, you know, we, we asked, basically I asked her about like, you know, how she got in horror and that kind of stuff and about the festival. And inevitably with all these conversations, you talked about COVID and pivoting during COVID and she had to do basically had to do a virtual fest last year. I think this year it's a combo of in person and virtual. And you know, it's really cool stuff. Talk about some things. Did a little gossiping that we had to cut out for obvious reasons. But you know, it's it's kind of nice to talk to someone that on a completely different coast does basically the same thing that I do. So it was a really great conversation. So why don't we jump into Kay Lynch from Salem Horror Fest? Joining us now is the Festival Director of Salem Horror Fest. Please welcome to The Void, Kay Lynch. Thank you. Now, I guess my first question before we get into Salem Horror Fest and how it came about is like, when did you find yourself being drawn to horror and cult films in general? I would say the very first introduction was the movie Gremlins. Just seeing it at a friend's house on VHS and it would always pop up. I never owned it, but I would always be at people's houses that owned it. And I would watch the first 20 minutes or so over and over again. Like, I just keep watching it. But once it got to the scene where the teacher puts the candy bar under the desk, I was like, okay, that's enough. <laughs> it's just <laughs> So when I was finally able to watch the entire movie, it was like a, a rite of passage to me where I was, uh, you know, I was like pushing myself. I had built it up in my mind what the rest of the movie might have been like. So it's become, that was my introduction, and it's become just like a very like important film for me just personally. But I would say that the film that kind of really solidified my position as a horror fan was watching Carrie on Joe Bob uh, on Saturday night on Monster Vision. And I uh, just caught it one night. I was enthralled. And, you know, at the very end, that jump scare when Susanel's hand comes out, it pops out of the grave. Um, I like nearly fell out of the couch, uh, fell out of the couch and I was obsessed with that feeling for like weeks being like, oh, I felt like I was having a heart attack. I don't know what a heart attack is, but like I felt, you know, um, you know, eventually learned that that was adrenaline, but <laughs> I got like, just was fascinated with that feeling being like, how can something as benign as just like a screen, um, create such a, uh, physiological reaction. I mean, it's one of the biggest scenes in horror ever. When it played in theaters and people weren't prepared, it was just, like, apparently just people, like, losing their shit. I, I kind of put it up there with, like, I will never, you know, probably fortunately, really, because I don't know if I want to live in there, but, like, at least cinema-going-wise, like, I'll never be able to get that shock ending of Night of the Living Dead or any of those movies, because I had experienced most of that at home, but, like, I couldn't imagine, like, seeing that in a theater and just being with a collective group of like just losing your shit yeah it would be terrifying and now it's funny because it's it's kind of quaint when you look at it now it's like <laughs> kind of a cheap shot <laughs> you're like okay that it's it, it is an easy way to get a response out of people but you know i'm sure it was somewhat novel at the time and it's it's one of those horror movies that even if you're not a horror fan you know most people still know the film exactly now, at what point did horror start becoming an obsession for you? Like, was there other films, or was it just, like, just, you know, consuming as much as you could? L largely, it began with Joe Bob and, and Monster Vision and watching watching him every week. And, you know, I first saw the 
first four Friday the 13th films, maybe, I think it was five actually, when he did the marathon, and then he did this whole rant about why he couldn't show part six. <laughs> just always going to the video store, just like so many people, being drawn to the cover artwork and renting stacks and stacks uh, of tapes, um, which of course was glorious then because you could get gosh, I wish I could remember that the, the actual deal, but I would I would walk out with like seven tapes and since they were from like the archives or the library section in the middle, it was always super cheap. And um, so I saw a ton of horror movies that way. Um, eventually uh, I started working at Blockbuster and so my movie viewing just continued to go up and I was able to see things as soon as they came to home video. And just going to, you know, Kmart next door, buying up all the VHS tapes that I wish I still had, taking home any posters or like marketing materials that were going to be thrown out. So it was, you know, pretty much my entire high school career was like focused on horror. That's amazing. And that's, I think that's what a lot of us went through was you get to that point, it's like, I need everything. I need to... There's no end to the video store. There's always something new to find, which is something I kind of love and miss, which you don't quite get with streaming. Don't want to knock streaming completely, but... But you can get it a little bit of that high from Letterboxd. Yeah, because that because that's the closest to the video store, because streaming limits your options because of curation through, you know, rights and that kind of stuff. Letterbox, you can just see the endless thing. You see someone like, hey, someone watched this movie. Don't know what that is. I need to go see it right now. Yeah. So, you know, the movies aren't all there for your consumption, but you can go down these rabbit holes and be like, well, who was the cinematographer for this? Oh, they did all these movies. I've never heard this film before. You just keep clicking, 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 and then, you know, uh, then your watch list just gets unmanageable. <laughs> <laughs> That's... That is the burden, but also the pleasure of being into the, like movies, <laughs> the never-ending watch list, <laughs> and especially horror because there's so many subgenres and little like I think about the opening credits of X Men, <laughs> and I kind of that's how I see like genre and films is like just all these little offshoots and these evolutions of how films evolve over time and how they inspire people to use all of their inspiration and references to create something new and just continues to snowball. Now, at what point did you feel drawn to do something more, or, I say, or should I say bigger, or I guess contribute to the horror community or, you know, har your love of horror? Was it just you had an idea to do something or were you actively like looking at like, maybe I can like, submit an article to the zine or you know maybe i can make my own movie was there any kind of push for that kind of stuff i would say um the my first jump into being like a creator of horror and in, in, in some in any sense it was really through theater i did theater for many years and when i eventually when i ended up moving to salem it's you know halloween town usa here everything is um you know we we love our halloween and so one of the things i did in 2012 was i created my own uh, original midnight rock horror show and um staged it at the cinema here and it was um part rock concert part musical part you know, short horror showcase. We showed four films and there was like skits and music in between and we created these characters. The show was called Scary Mary and the Audio Corset. And the basic premise was this character was, uh, sh she died from the result of a high school prank gone wrong that resulted in her soul getting trapped in an audio cassette tape that became lost over time. And, you know, playing the tape backwards today brings her back to life into the cinema and so all the music was this, you know, kind of hair metal, pop, pop metal kind of um, sound. And uh, and she introduced and introduced the films. So that was kind of my first contribution to like creating something within the horror genre and and doing it here in Salem. Um, and and over time, like I've done events here for about fifteen years now. Um, I 
ran a queer event company for a few years. I've done fundraisers. I've produced re like uh, recycling PSAs. So I've done a lot of things here in town. But when it came to Salem Horror Fest, it was the first step was me being fed up at my corporate job, <laughs> and um, I was working for a, a dating app company, and um, you know which was kind of exciting, but like any nine to five office job this all the politics and that sort of this office culture just not for me I got burnt out and so I quit and you know needed to figure out real quick okay now what and that lined up with the 2016 election and so when all that you know shit went down um, you know, I, like so many people, really worried, concerned, angry, and for me, you know, I, I like, again, like many other people wanting to do something about it, what is something actually productive that I can do? Well, <laughs> my whole entire skill set is based on marketing and events, so I'm not going to be able to save the world with that, <laughs> but I can contribute to... Um, shaping public perception and creating conversation around things that I find that are, are important. And I find, uh, I found that, you know, horror has always been this reflection of society and this space to navigate our fears and anxieties. And in a time where so many marginalized groups are on high alert and, re you know, very concerned about, you know, what might be coming, I, you know, I kind of saw horror as this sort of therapy, as this way to talk about really complicated, um, horrifying things in a way that is fun, um, productive, and like Roger Ebert had um, always said about, you know, movies being empathy machines. I really thought about that as a tool to allow people to kind of experience each other's fears, because I found a lot of the arguments about political things um, today usually end up with you're overreacting, you know, or like, I don't understand why, like, that is a stupid concern or, you know, there's a sort of this, like, negating someone else's fears. And horror is a place where your fears are validated and they give you this sort of safe track to navigate these terrifying scenarios um, or ideas in a way where there's still guardrails and you get the the thrill from it or the catharsis from it in in a safe way and my hope is that if people can watch a horror movie and see something that might not be a concern of theirs in everyday life it's not like a real high up on the phobia list of them personally, if most horror films, whether they're good or bad, most of them are on some level effective at at least conveying the danger of the characters in the film. And so I kind of latched onto that idea of using that as a platform and connecting it to Salem's history and creating an event and a community of people who want to explore the subtext of horror and explore the therapeutic elements of it and to you know have a space where their voices could be heard and elevated i mean that's the perfect encapsulation of just horror in general and what it does because you know i think we both or on Twitter, which is cesspool, obviously, but you see weird hot takes where, like, horror's not political and stuff like that, which is, you know, clearly bullshit, because any horror movie that came out of the 70s is coming out of Vietnam, so it's clearly political, regardless of what some people think. But it, the the thing I liked when I saw Salem Horror Fest come out, and it's kind of the reason why I like being part of Beyond Fest, that, you know, we wear our politics and love on our sleeves, which I think is something that, you know, be who you are, be, you know, represent horror to its fullest. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think the people who say, oh, like, keep your politics out of my horror or, or, or movies in general or art um, of any kind, 
I think there's this misconception that politics means I'm voting for this person. Like, that's not, like, politics means about, is, is really about societal interactions and power dynamics. And, you know, there's gender politics, there's sexual politics, and, it, you know, all these things don't, they're not ultimately about I'm voting for the X. It, they're about um, the the conflicts and the um, disproportionate uh, power between you know between groups and um, and concerns and so I think that even if a, a director isn't intending to make an overt statement the fact that the film is coming out at a specific time in a specific um, environment or culture uh, whether it's conscious or not, it is still a product of that time capsule. And so, yeah, so like George Romero, like there's a lot of his films are clearly like obvious messages, but like like any book um, or piece of art, like even if those messages aren't obvious, there's still how it's interpreted. Once the film is out in the world, it belongs to all of us now. And so even if we see something uh, in it that the director did not intend, that doesn't make that observation any less valid. Exactly. That's, that's kind of like the Nightmare on Elm Street 2 syndrome with Jack's shoulder. Because <laughs> he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean this is like, you know, a me metaphor for coming out of the closet? And it's just like, did you watch your own movie? Right. <laughs> Which is why I, that's one of my favorite Elm Street movies, because it just leans so hard on it. I know, I think it was written in the script that way, and just Jack Shoulder just not being aware of it, just like kept hitting it every nail so hard on the head that it's just like, you didn't realize that? What the <laughs> was going on? Now, you kind of talked about creating, or the creation of Salem Horror Fest. What went into it from 2016 to 2017 to make the fest actually happen? Because you said you had a marketing and background, which I'm going to point out for anyone listening that's interested in doing a film festival, how valuable that is. Because if, if you can't market, ain't no one coming to your fest. So I guess my long-winded question here is, you know, how did from the election and wanting to do something bigger in the world from in 2016 get to Salem Horror Fest in 2017? So I think starting in 2015, I w started doing a short horror showcase. So I did one in 2015, 2016, and then we did um, in October, and then we did like a Christmas holiday themed one in December of 2016. And so that was kind of like my in, like the momentum that was building towards the festival. And in fact, the last sh uh, sh showcase that we did i had written up this sort of like skit it was like during the election but it was or it was like earlier on it was like the primaries were still happening and the whole sort of like joke of the skit was sort of like we need your support we rally together we gotta come together and you know use horror as a way to uplift others and just kind of this like really silly thing and the the main joke was like, things could be even scarier next year, you know, implying that Trump might win. <laughs> and we really thought that was a joke then. <laughs> and so the whole sort of, like, rally the troops um, message that was supposed to be silly after the election was like, fuck, no, we really actually have to do this. Yeah. Thankfully, I already had a relationship with the cinema, so I was able to just kind of say, this is what I want to do. And producing any event is extremely hard. And you mentioned you mentioned like the benefit of having a marketing background. It is very true. I believe there's no such thing as too much marketing. But even then, like to get someone to come out of their house to spend money, find parking, um, and sit in a dark theater for something that they might not know anything about is challenging. My initial approach was to book a lot of repertory stuff, you know, familiar titles that people would have some recognition of, and uh, pair them together around certain themes and kind of use that as a way to kind of present 
the mission of what we're going for. So we did like Get Out and People Under the Stairs, Toxic Avenger, and um, Day of the Dead. And, you know, we did uh, a lot of like feminist programming and queer program. We did Cruising and uh, Nightmare 2. And so that was sort of our way to at least get the ball rolling, you know, and, and as a, a, a new fest or a young fest, you know, your submissions aren't, aren't, you know, you're only getting so many submissions to start because you're, people don't know about you yet. And, and, you know, you're not high on everyone's list to like, I want my film to premiere at this fest yet. We knew that we needed to build momentum to get to a point where our funnel for interest from filmmakers to take part, you know, we'd have to tap into some of, some of those titles. Um, and Salem being such a tourist city you know it it, it it was a way to kind of get them to come in because they can say oh i've never seen they live on the big screen and we actually showed we showed they live in the mist as a double feature on uh columbus uh indigenous people's day and that was that, a lot of, that was a lot of fun that that's a pretty good double feature very upbeat uplifting endings there yeah which one did we start with we started <laughs> We started with They Live, so we definitely ended with a downer. What's it like doing the fest in Salem? Do you have any in-town partners and out-of-town partners that you work with to make the fest happen each year? Yeah, so it's crazy. <laughs> um, so Salem, despite its you know, world-renowned reputation for better and worse, mostly worse, um, <laughs> you know, if you're even if you're um, you know in Europe or Places in Asia, if you say Salem, they'll at least have some a sort of connection to what, what that means. It's a tiny, it's a tiny city. It's a really, you could walk around the perimeter of, like, the tourist district probably, like, in an hour and have, like, gone a loop around the entire area. And um, we have only have three uh, boutique hotels, and the so they get booked like November, right after October, they st already start booking. What they do is if you stay at one of the hotels, you get, I think it's like two to four weeks to book again next year before anyone else can. So there's a percentage of those hotels that are even before November 1st are already spoken for. So it is, uh, it is a lot of people in a very small area. Salem gets 1 million visitors every year half of that is in October alone. <laughs> and so, and because of that, you know, a lot of people assume, well, it must be really easy <laughs> to, to, to produce a festival and with so many people. And, um, you know, there's this perception that like, it's like shooting fish in a barrel, but I always say that it's more like throwing a lasso around a salmon. You know, it's like really hard to catch the attention of these people who are in town a lot because of the excitement, the mobs of people. You can have a great time in Salem simply just walking around. There's a lot of excitement. It's like really pretty architecture, historic buildings, people in costumes, um, you know, street barkers, it's, you know, all kinds of stuff. But it's really difficult to get into a restaurant. And um, so there's, there's a lot of these challenges. And of course, what we're trying to do with the festival is more than be a, you know, we don't, our goal is not to be a tourist destination. So when we're building an audience of people who are interested in what we're doing, it's it can be difficult because if they hear about us in August, where are they going to stay? Now, there are a lot of places that people can stay. They're just not in the downtown area. So there's a lot of education that we need to do to say, here's where you can stay and here's how you can do it. So have a great time. So it has a lot of a lot of challenges in, in balancing those two audiences. So something that I've not really said much um, but in this October, we will be announcing that we're going to move the fest, the core fest to May next year. And that will allow us a little more breathing room, a little more opportunity to create what so many great festivals are able to do is this sense of community, this sort of like microcosm where like you go to a bar after and you see other people with the lanyard. And, and that's something that's really difficult to do in October here. I'm going to always program in October. But, you know, now that this is our fifth year, we've grown the festival to a point where a lot of people are aware of, of that we're here. And, um, and, and 
especially the filmmakers. So our some we get a lot of submissions now, and um, I want to support the craft. I want to support the people who are doing the actual work. And so, um, you know, I really think that we need to create an atmosphere where we can really focus on what is being presented. And so I'm really excited about that opportunity. And this year will be really our, our first year where the premieres are the majority aspect of our program. And I, I just want to say, I do like the idea of like, I know someone's going to say, but it's October, you need to do Salem Harpeth. But the thing is, it's like, I've been to Salem on Halloween and in October, it's a madhouse. And, you know, it's, I think it's actually, again, going back to your marketing background, really smart to like put it at a time where like things are cheaper for people to come to. There's actually rooms available. You're not going to be like crushed in a mob of people in like Boston Red Sox jerseys for Halloween or whatever. It's, yeah, I've actually gone to Salem in May and it's like, it's a pretty beautiful time to be there. Like, it's spring. Yeah, it's spring. And, you know, honestly, most everything that happens in October happens in May, happens every other month. Um, the, the, the only real difference is fewer people um, yeah. and the weather. But it's something I'm really looking forward to. And, and again, we're still going to program in October. But I want to create a community of people who are here for a reason and not necessarily just they're you know stumbling in and be like oh this looks fun and we welcome them but that's not the purpose of the festival now with that said do you get a lot of people that are obviously traveling in town be it filmmakers and like just fans that are coming from do you have people that come from all over to go to salem horror fest each year yeah last or not last year 2019 we had someone flying from japan to meet john waters which is awesome <laughs> We had someone fly in from Australia to see the Faculty of, uh, the Faculty of Horror live podcast, uh, which is really cool. We have um, a lot of people from France, Germany, Canada, UK, Ireland. Yeah, it's sounds this revolving door uh, of, of tourists from all over. And school groups are huge here, even from other countries. They, um, and press, too. You know, we have... Um, magazine outlets newspapers from all over the world that come here and our we have a really great tourism bureau like a department and that manages all of this that's that's fantastic now when you're putting together the fest what is your programming philosophy for the festival in general what do you look for in like new films rep titles who do you want to bring the events other i think you did like a book club type event as well when you're looking at the fest and saying this is what i want to do do you have an overall theme you're looking for for each year or are you just looking at like these are the cool things i want to hit this year i try to find uh ideas or trends or themes that are of interest to me and me observing what other people are interested in and also what is relevant to sort of the national conversation. So I, I, I kind of first just kind of put my feelers out and go like, what is this moment like in, that we're in and how can we comment on it and break that down into themes and then connect those to certain titles. Even if like we're not going to show certain films, I still create these like letterbox lists of just films that evoke certain themes. And even that will inspire other sort of films or program ideas. And then so I then I try to cluster them. Like what are the things that are coming up that are related that I can put them into a, a, their own little collection. So we've never really done an overarching theme it's always like we'll have sort of like a marketing aesthetic and a you know a tagline that is kind of our, our unifying message, but the program itself is often um, a collection of programs um, or uh, pods. <laughs> you know, we may have like three different types of collections, and within them are programs that are related to each other in some way. So, like Feed Your Brain was a campaign that we did. To promote reading in general, we did a book drive, and our programs were all films that were based on books. Frankenstein, Brian Frankenstein. We did six Stephen King films. Um, you know, we just we showed a lot. I think we showed 
somewhere between 15 and 20 films in that, just that program alone. You know, our first year, it was like every night was a different double feature based on a theme. And um, the second year, we did Earth Doom. So we did a whole weekend about eco-horror. And we did Weekend of the Witch, which was a whole weekend about feminist witchcraft. So we just kind of find these like unifying themes and kind of bundle programs within that. That's amazing. You've booked many major guests for the fest. Who are some of your favorites that you've been able to bring to Salem over the years? The ones that I would first tell 10-year-old me <laughs> that I would eventually get the book would be Elvira and John Waters. Like, they're just uh, huge icons, um, obviously, with in, in horror and cult films. And, and, and um, they're queer icons. They're... Um, you know, comedians, they're just really, you know, funny people that are brands within themselves, like even just their personalities are legendary icons. So, you know, th those are just like really big moments for me personally. And, and um, you know, as, as, as my career develops, but uh, Lar Park Lincoln was probably the most fun guest we've ever had from Friday the 13th, part seven. She was just so fun and when we <laughs> we had an after party at bit bar and you know all of us were there and she was the last one to leave <laughs> um and she wasn't drinking so she wasn't like you know a mess or anything she was just so full of energy so full of life and just a really a really sweet woman gosh we've had so many now that it's you know trying to think like oh, they've all been great one of the beautiful things about Salem and inviting people to come to Salem is that it's on most people's bucket list. You know, a lot of these people who do the convention, the convention circuits, they um, are often regulated to the basement of hotel room, uh, convention centers or whatever. Like this, you know, kind of like a very kind of bland thing. Like if you're in the building, you could be in any city, USA, a lot of these places. And so I think that there's sort of this, oh, Salem, that sounds fun. Of course, October is high holiday for anyone in the industry, so it's very competitive. But when they come here, I've had at least 15 to 20 guests say, I could see myself living here. <laughs> they like, they just really connect to the atmosphere. Um, you know, obviously in October, there's, there's like a hyperactive, you know, a hyperactive atmosphere, uh, that's full of energy that can, that can be really fun to experience, but also it's just beautiful, interesting place. The people year round here are, you know, very unique, creative, curious, rebellious. Like it is actually is a city of really interesting personalities too. As a former Baltimorean John Waters is always going to be close to my heart. I used to see him occasionally. He would go to the punk and metal shows, show up, have a couple martinis, and leave. <laughs> That's awesome. It was he would go to like it'd be like Dillinger Escape Plan. And it was like there's John Waters there drinking a martini. Wow, I love. There's so many stories I've heard of like people. Oh, and there's John Waters. <laughs> like he to, like P Town. He goes to P Town every year, and I like so many stories of him riding his bike or him <laughs> at certain parties. My favorite personal weird John Waters appearance. It was um. There's an old club in Baltimore. It still exists, but it was at its old location called the Auto Bar, and it was like a, I think, these grindcore bands, Pig Destroyer and Phobia. If you don't know what grindcore is, it's just like really fast, heavy, punk, death metal hybrid kind of thing. And we're all staying outside, and all of a sudden, John Waters steps out. Everyone freezes. John Waters just kind of slides and goes behind a dumpster and then disappears. And it's just <laughs> like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> when we, um, we've had Linnea quickly here twice... Um, she's really fun and really sweet too. Yeah. And we um, we took her to a, a metal concert here, like that was, that was happening here. And oh my god, the the lead singer, like his mind, ex like <laughs> you could see his <laughs> his brain explode because he's singing and obviously you know putting on this like really aggressive performance. Um, and then he you could see that he noticed that she was like three feet away from him and it was it was really adorable and she was just there rocking till last call and people you know being just hanging out with people and everyone just you know not 
not not being able to you know believe it um it's really special i mean that... lene is like one of the most metal horror icons we have and she did a mean workout video too absolutely we <laughs> one of the things we did with her is we did the actual not the actual horror workout but we had someone who's an aerobics instructor create a horror workout that she <laughs> participated in so in the mornings of the festival we had a we had a physical fitness <laughs> program with Linnea quigley and friends that's probably the best thing i've ever heard a festival do because what, what do you do at a festival you sit you drink you eat you don't move i think I might make that suggestion beyond fest. We need to do a fucking workout before we like get into it. Let's well, do some jumping well, jacks or something. <laughs> maybe for the crowd, it's a workout for me the whole time that I'm there. But like, oh yeah, just just get everyone active. You know, you know, you don't want to get like too too relaxed. You want that energy. Now, something not so great. Last year, obviously, we were in a global pandemic, which you had to shift the festival to virtual. What was it like having the pivot of format with like really no time and just having like split second decisions on what you were going to actually do if you wanted to do the fest this year? It was really stressful <laughs> um, because, you know, not only did we have to figure out what we were going to do, we had already announced a lot of programs. And so we're selling tickets too. So we, you know, in the beginning of the year, we had announced Joe Bob for October. Then we were planning a weekend event, a conference called Women with Guts, and it was going to be a whole weekend conference dedicated to women in horror. Um, and so it, we were already in production mode. And then when you know things started developing, we realized, oh shit, this is. This is an actual thing. We were stuck in between of like, what are we going to do with the events that we're already promoting? And now that we can't move forward with them, what do we do now? So it was it was pretty <laughs> frightening, but thankfully we we made it work. Just did some quick research of the virtual platforms that were out there. I had attended some virtual festivals, and a lot of them were pretty clunky like there was just not a great experience so when i saw the vimeo platform that looked like the cadillac option for us pretty pricey you know um but i knew that i'd rather if we're going to do this that we have a festival that goes off without a hitch that it's smooth people are familiar with vimeo and something that is really positive that came out of it was our Ability to focus even more so on the independent filmmakers. So, like I had mentioned before, when people are coming here to Salem, and if we're programming a micro-budget film that no one's heard of, it can be hard to get people to come out. Um, again, because of the traffic and the insanity of October, but it's hard to get people to come to any event. The audiences for stuff that people never heard of are always much smaller. And that's always bothered me, but I knew we needed to get to a point where we had a bigger audience to trust you know, our, our, our curation. But what doing it virtually allowed us to do was, well, allowed our audience to do was to just check out these films. And if they get 10 min minutes into something that they're not connecting with, there's so much more that they can discover. So the like level of investment to a particular title is really low. And because of that, we had this audience of people from all over the world who were able to watch so many more films and the type of films that weren't going to get that kind of audience otherwise. What that did was those films, these tiny you know, micro-budget films, got a ton of critic reviews, um, got a ton of social media chatter, and the um, distributors, we had a ton of distributors pick up the, these, you know, these tiny films. Threshold just premiered on um, on Arrow and the stuff coming to Shudder and um, it was stuff I can't say yet. But it, I'm just really excited because that is what we want to do. We want to support the filmmakers and the benefit to the audience beyond just having a little more freedom to explore things. Salem is is... If you're coming to October, if you're flying from California, for example, it's really expensive. You gotta fly. 
it's like a 40 minute ride from the airport to Salem. Mm-hmm. You got to pay for the hotel. Everything's at a premium. You got to food, whatever events you're going to do. Two people, if you're going for a long weekend, easily two grand um, just for a long weekend. That's a lot of money for a short for a short trip. There are a lot of barriers for people being able to experience Salem, whether it's the cost, whether it's, I mean, we're <laughs> the second oldest city in the nation, so handicap accessible is not really something we excel at. Getting the time off from work, and there's just so many barriers um, to people who want to participate in our festival that can't. So the virtual component really was a really allowed us to to reach those people. And, and I'm really thankful for that. And so uh, because of all the eyeballs that got to fall upon these, you know, these tiny films, it's given us the momentum to lean into that. The filmmakers were very grateful for the, their response. They were just, they were effusive and just how it went for them and, and their own experience with it. And that really encouraged us to go, okay, well, let's keep doing that. What can we do more? How can we grow this? Now, how can I translate that to live? And and that that is what led to our partnership with the George A. Romero Foundation. How'd you become a partner with the George A. Romero Foundation? I wanted to create a fellowship program. And, um, you know, that was one of the ideas that came out of thinking, how can we expand our support? You know, I developed this concept and then um, thinking of well who who most embodies the spirit of DIY filmmaking and I always go back to George like he is the like patron saint of anyone can make a film and you don't have to be in Hollywood to do it I've always been inspired by that and so I was just I reached out to the organization um, really just to ask for permission to call it the George A. Romero Foundation Fellowship. And um, as luck would have it, they responded in saying, this is something we actually been wanting to do. Can we just do it together? And so that just kind of opened the dialogue between us and we started developing this program and we're developing other uh, other programs together, um, all focused on supporting independent filmmakers their involvement in our festival here in Salem, and now I'm involved with um, some of the really cool initiatives that they're doing in Pittsburgh. And I think it's this perfect like union of pockets of horror history, and um, I think it's a really good collaboration. That's excellent. I'm excited to see a lot of things that are going to be unraveling, because I know they have footage that hasn't been seen. I, I really hope one day them or someone finds that three hour cut of martin that the black do you know about that version not no i know that there's a 4k coming out so romero's original cut of martin was three hours and in black and white and rubenstein's like we can't release a three hour black and white vampire movie in the 70s and he had he had a print of it made and it vanished like i think there was a flood at the um, latent image or like whatever like whatever his um office studio like thing was and like they don't know if someone stole it if it's in someone's like closet all right well i'll i'll see what i can dig up uh and um, (laughs) there are other you know not not that i I haven't heard anything about that but there are other things in the works of um you know in terms of restoration and people still discovering projects that you know they didn't no one realized that he was working on and um part of you know, the, the work that the foundation has been doing is working with the University of Pittsburgh and creating the archive, the George Romero archive, which is how housing all these scripts, promotional materials, actual films. This is how amusement park has you know, was become restored. And so there's a lot of really exciting things that are still being discovered and act, being actively worked on. That's... That's a great initiative because, you know, Romero was one of those, he was one of the regional filmmakers. I don't know, I, I love regional filmmakers. Like, most of the people that became big icons in horror started as a regional filmmaker. And Romero was one that kind of, he got to the main, I don't want to say mainstream because that Romero's never been exactly mainstream. But he got to, like, the studio level 
but always maintain his roots as kind of like, I'm from Pittsburgh, my films are about Pittsburgh, they're around Pittsburgh. Even when he was shooting in Canada, they were still about Pittsburgh. I love that about him. It's just he has this, there's a punk rock spirit to that that I love. That like, you know what, like, I have something to say, I'm going to figure it out. (laughs) Whatever it takes, I'm going to figure it out. And I think that's where the most exciting things happen with any kind of art, but especially in film, because it is so difficult to make a film and it requires the participation of so many people, such a wide variety of skill set that any film that gets made is a miracle. But unless you have a ton of money, like studios do to, to finance something, it requires a really passionate, somewhat crazy, stubborn person to make it happen. I th- I, that's why I think he's the perfect mascot or someone who's emblematic of of what we want to support and just encourage anyone with the passion or interest to make a film to say you can do it it might not be the glitz and glamour version that you might have had in your head when you were a kid but it doesn't require that not you know films don't require the max treatment of a you know of a film if you have an interesting story there are plenty of people out there who want to see something unique and I mean, that's a beautiful way to sum up George's legacy overall. I guess my final question is, as the festival continues to grow and evolve, where do you see Salem Horror Fest heading in the future? Well, so, yeah, like I I mentioned, this is our fifth year, and we've learned a lot over the last few years. There's a lot of throwing things up against the wall, seeing what sticks. You know, after our third year, we started to feel like we were finding a groove, and then COVID happened, so we were like, oh, I guess we have to reinvent the wheel. So now coming out of it, and we have a really good base to grow from, and a great start to our initiative for the filmmakers. And so my most important mission with the program is to grow independent voices, and to you know to be able to showcase more independent films, to develop a bigger audience for them, to be a partner with the filmmakers to meet their goals, to meet, you know, to get distribution or to get whatever PR buzz or whatever it is. When when we um, program someone's film, we ask them, we, we talk to them, what are your goals? What can we do to support that? You know, not everyone has the same goal, but a lot of them are similar. So, we, you know, we're trying to develop the systems in which that we can give everyone that support and continue to build on our relationships with people in the industry. I mean, we were very grateful to have relationships with, um, you know, the, the horror media outlets and distribution companies and some of the studios and everything, and just connect people with what they're looking for, whether it's other professionals, whether it's financing or, you know, a live audience and what I found that people the filmmakers want more than anything is their film on a screen in an actual cinema with a packed house and everyone knows that it, it's been a challenge um, even before COVID it was starting to look dicey but I hope that everything that has happened in the last year has kind of reminded us of you know what's important and that if we want to preserve this experience, we're going to have to work hard to do it. And so I want to build the independent voices and also just grow the festival as a community, as a safe space for any marginalized community, anyone who feels like they're the only whatever they identify at, at an event. Like we don't I've been there as a queer person. My husband's been there as you know a, a black man. Um, just that feeling of like I'm the only, <laughs> you know, everyone else is the same but me. I want to create a space where people don't have to think about that and um, and give them the platform to participate and to create what it is. You know, beyond the films, there's so many podcasters, writers designers there's just no shortage of people in the horror community that are creating all kinds of art and we want to be a stage for it okay i want to thank you so much for joining me today this has been an absolute pleasure thank you i really enjoyed this we're going to take a quick commercial break but when we return we're going to talk more about salem cinema on the cinematic void podcast Happy Halloween, darlings. It's me, Elvira, coming at you from the witch capital of the world, Salem, Mass. 
talking about Salem, Massachusetts here on the Cinematic Void podcast, and we were talking about, you know, contemporary of mine, film programmer, but Salem also has some films that were shot there as well. Most recently, Hubie Halloween with Adam Sandler, that was shot and took place at Salem, and of course there's the, I'd say the big two, which is Hocus Pocus and The Lords of Salem, although Hocus Pocus probably shot much more in like LA and like the studio setting then in Salem, same with Lords of Salem, but they took, they took advantage of a lot of like locations there. You get to see, um, Salem town hall and Hocus Pocus. You get to see, you know, the bewitch statue in, um, Lords of Salem. So you use location, but you know, there are two Salem movies. And I think we've, I've talked about this before on the podcast, but one of the most insane, ridiculous things that, I'm surprised I was even allowed to do and pull off was I did a screening of Hocus Pocus and Lords of Salem together, part of the um, Cinematic Void New England Nightmare series, which was, you know, movies that took place in, like, New England. I think I hit every state except for Vermont. Sorry, Vermont. Next time. But, you know, there's some other things that, you know, Salem adjacent. There's the Midnight Hour, which we've talked about quite a bit which it's, the town is Pitchfork Cove, but really it's Salem, Massachusetts, witch history, all that stuff. Like, if you know anything about Salem or ever been to Salem, like, it's very transparent that midnight hour is Salem. But back to that screening I did. When I did the Hocus Pocus Lords of Salem screening, I actually ended up doing two Q&As that night. For Hocus Pocus, I had writer-producer David Kirshner, writer Mick Garris, composer John Debney, effects artist Tony Gardner, who worked on things like Return of Living Dead, and friend of the void and production designer William Sandell, who, one of my favorite people to talk to. He's worked on all kinds of stuff. He did a lot of Paul Verhoeven movies at one point, too. For Lords of Salem, I had actor Jeff Daniel Phillips, Meg Foster, who's probably best known for a role in John Carpenter's They Live, and Judy Geeson. My Hocus Pocus Q&A was actually used by Mick Harris for his own podcast, Postmortem, and I shot Mick a little email and said, if it was, I asked him if it would be cool if I used part of this discussion here, and he said, yeah, absolutely. So I just grabbed a little excerpt. It's not the full thing, but it's in, in this part of the Q&A, you can hear myself as well as Mick Garris and production designer William Sindel talking about working and shooting in Salem. So let's listen to that. At what point did Salem become the focal or like the focal point of the film or as a location? Well, from the very beginning, you know, David's story was set there. I had never been there before, but I went on a location scout to, to just learn a little bit about it. Well, Salem, around Halloween time, it's 10 days of celebration of Halloween, climaxing on Halloween night with a candlelight vigil of the witches of Salem going to Gallows Hill, where the witches were killed. Now, um, the witches of Salem are not what you think of. They're mostly really new age shop owners that are kind of assholes. Um, <laughs> they're they're, they're can Candle and crystal shops. And exactly. And they're very arrogant about their witchdom. And uh, if you're an outsider or non-believer, you know. Uh, <laughs> May the but, record but, show Mick gave them the finger, but. Yes. <laughs> but Salem itself is an amazing place, and it still has, the House of the Seven Gables is still there. It's this unbelievable pocket of time and atmosphere this whole 10 day celebration that I literally every year after that on Halloween went back six years in a row just because I loved it so much. And that was if you want to hear the whole the conversation, plus a bonus discussion <laughs> between Mick and David Kirshner, it's available on Mick's, you know, podcast channel. So look up postmortem. I've 
I'm pretty sure it's available on all major podcast platforms just like this. It's a really fun conversation and, you know, it's kind of cool to talk about it. But with all that said, as much love as Hocus Pocus and Lords of Salem get for being Salem movies, they weren't the first movies to be shot and take place in Salem. And not a lot of people know that. And I'm not talking about like the um the Crucible or anything like that, which is like based on the Salem Witch Trials, but it's really about the Red Scare. And obviously there's the House of Seven Gables, which because Nathaniel Hawthorne lived in Salem, and the House of Seven Gables is a place you can actually go and visit in Salem. But I don't think the movie was actually shot there. But the first horror movie feature length. Not counting Bewitched, which shot some episodes in one of its later, maybe the last season of Bewitched, they went to Salem and shot there. But the first full-length horror movie was shot in 1982 in Salem. It was directed by Bird Eye Gordon, a.k.a. Mr. Big, a.k.a. the original Notorious B.I.G. Notorious! I always, it's fucking hilarious because, like, he made a bunch of, like, giant size like, monster movies, like, big creatures and all that. And he also made some cool occult movies like Necromancy as well. But he made this movie called Burned at the Stake, a.k.a. The Coming. The Coming is the worst fucking title for a horror movie ever because it just sounds like a porn. And I'm pretty sure like that title got it stuck in the behind the black curtain back in the you know video store days at certain points. Now, the film itself is not very historically accurate it, because it's right in the title. No witches were actually burned at the stake in Salem. That is exclusively a European thing. People accused of witchcraft were hung, with the exception of Giles Corey, who was pressed to death, which we'll talk a little bit in the next conversation that's coming up. Another interesting thing about burned at the stake, though, is it used a lot of locations. It is It used the old Burying Point Cemetery, which is one of the oldest cemeteries in America, and it also used the Salem Witch Museum, which is kind of the best museum on, you know, the Salem Witch Trials. It's the only one that, like, keeps things accurate, historically accurate. And when they learn new information, they include it. It also includes, like, another room where you can learn about, like, modern witchcraft and how it evolved and how the perception of witches evolved. The other thing about this movie is that one of the consultants on it was Lori Cabot. Now, if you don't know who Lori Cabot is, she became the official witch of Salem late 60s, early 70s. Like, she's the one who brought kind of like witches to Salem, like real witches, practicing witches. And she built a community there. She opened the first witch shop in Salem, and that's Crowhaven Corner, which she no longer owns. She sold it to someone else, and she started another store. And her daughter, Penny, was also a consultant. I think Penny's listed in the credits as like a costume designer. And the main witch character in this movie is 100% based on Lori Cabin. Hmm. If you go, there's a, if you go on YouTube and watch a In Search Of, which is an old 70s TV show that Leonard Nimoy hosted and narrated, there's an episode on Salem where they interview Lori Cabin. And if you look at Lori Cabot in that show and you go watch Burned at the Stake, you'll see pretty direct influence there. Now, when... I decided we're going to do this Salem episode. I was like, I want to get someone to talk about Burned at the Stake because it's kind of obscure. And part of the reason it's kind of obscure, it's it's basically stuck on VHS. But I did screen it as one of the Cinematist movies earlier in the pandemic. And when I did, I got an email from someone watching it who knew the um, boom operator that worked on that movie. It was this gentleman whose name was Ken Beechin. I hope I'm saying his name right. Ken ended up writing me an email and he talked about working on the movie and told some fun anecdotes and one that was pretty hilariously offensive that when they were shooting the old Bearing Point Cemetery, this couple kind of went in with a six pack of beer and was kind of hanging out and then like as they're filming, the dude's getting a blowjob while they're filming scenes in like complete view of the camera and all that kind of stuff. Which was kind of funny, but like he talked about shooting in the Salem Witch Museum, that kind of stuff. Are those, uh, you know, kind of little Easter eggs in the, that are still in the film? I don't think you can see that in the movie, but oh. like the he was just bringing up things that were happening while they're shooting, mm-hmm. and like that kind of stuff. Now, back to like wanting to talk about this movie on this podcast because, like, you know, I've already we talked about Hocus Pocus last year on the on or on Halloween episode, and we could have talked about it again, but 
you know, it's it's kind of a big movie and people know what it is. Same with Lords of Salem and all that. I wanted to find someone willing to talk talk about it. And the first people I reached out to was Lori and Penny Cabot, who have a new shop in Salem that's kind of near the waterfront. It's called Enchanted. I wrote them, never heard back. And that's fair. It might be like they don't give a shit or they don't remember or they're embarrassed by it, whatever. It could be a million reasons or I didn't offer money or something like that. I'm not saying they're money or they don't no, check email, no check email. Like it just was info at enchanted. So it could have went to the spam or something like that. So my next idea was to email the Salem witch museum, even though I was like pretty sure that anyone working there now probably wasn't there when they filmed it or knew anything about this movie. And to my surprise, the response I got was, Oh, we're very familiar with Burned at the Stake, a.k.a. The Coming. We would love to talk to you about it. So this next conversation is with Rachel Christ from the Salem Witch Museum, who is kind enough to talk about the history of the museum itself. It's a really cool building, and it's kind of really interesting how it came to be. Also got to get some more insight on this Bird Eye Gordon production. So this is from the conversation I had with Rachel on June 24th, 2021. Joining us now is the Director of Education for the Salem Witch Museum. Please welcome the void, Rachel Christ. Rachel, how are you doing today? I'm well, how are you? I'm doing well as well. First, could you tell us a little bit about your job at the museum? Sure, so I'm the Director of Education, which is really a much bigger job than it sounds, as we are quite a small museum. So as is the case for often for small museums, I wear many different hats within kind of my Uh, capacity as director of education. So a lot of things have changed, obviously, over the past year with COVID. Normally, uh, in normal times, a big part of my job is training our staff to give tours. We have actually changed our second exhibit, which is uh, has been staff led in the past to be an audio tour um, to help eliminate some person to person contact. So that has actually been a big change we've undergone this year. But beyond that, I oversee the, um, you know, the kind of education-based components of the museum. So for example, I work with students and teachers. I've been doing virtual classrooms for the past year. I curate our exhibits. I research our exhibits. Uh, I'm the one who's in charge of making sure everything in the museum is historically accurate. Um, and working towards updating the exhibits, which is a very very slow and complicated process. I've been in charge of collecting objects and building a collection for the museum. I run our social media outreach, so our Facebook, our Instagram page, um, a lot of different things. I, you know, curate our online presence, our website, and so on. Um, So it's a really fun job. It's definitely never a boring job, so... (laughs) That sounds a lot of fun. Having been to Salem many times over the last 20 some years, I've always gone to the Witch Museum, even though like a lot of people are like, but it's just the, the shadow, you know, kind of thing. And it's just like, but it's it's probably out of all the museums there, the most informative. Plus, you get the second part of the museum, which goes over witchcraft and witches over the history, which a lot of the museums kind of sidestep to go towards the more salacious end of the witch trials. Yes, definitely. Now, I guess my next question is, how did the Salem Witch Museum come to be? Because for years, Salem kind of steered away from that kind of history. Can you tell us a little bit about how the Salem Witch Museum became what it is now? Sure. So um, you're correct in that uh, for years, the city really... And, you know, the immediate area, Essex County is really where the witch trials took place. They took place here and in Danvers and, um, you know, it kind of touched many of the areas around us. And for um, a long time, the idea was to kind of just push it to the side and not talk about it. That really started to change at the beginning of the 20th century. You start to see a slow trickle of tourists coming to the city to learn about the witch trials, to see where the witch trials had taken place. But it's actually really um, two kind of pop culture sites that bring uh, major attention to Salem. So the Crucible, Arthur Miller's play, which comes out in the 1950s, um, really starts to get people thinking about the Salem witch trials again in a much deeper way. Um, And then also kind of amusingly, um, Bewitched, the television series came and filmed here. And that really drew attention. They did a 
arc that's like five or six episodes called the Salem Saga, where um, they actually had a fire in uh, their studio in California. So they came to Salem to do on-site filming. Um, and that really got people's attention back on Salem. So uh, what started to happen was tourists were coming here wanting to learn about the Salem witch trials. And short of going to the Essex Institute and seeing the court documents, the primary source documents, there was really no way to learn about the witch trials. And that's when our museum was kind of born. So we opened our doors in May of 1972. And the idea was to uh, teach the story of the Salem witch trials in a way that's understandable and kind of palatable to a wide audience. Um, so as you said, we're kind of a non-traditional museum. It's presentation based. And that's a pretty intentional choice. I mean, part of it is that there aren't many artifacts from the Salem witch trials. So having kind of a traditional gallery really wasn't an option. There's really just the court documents. But the idea also was this is a place where uh, children can come, adult learners, lifelong learners, college students, you know, people from foreign countries. It's kind of a place that makes the history immersive and understandable to a uh, wider audience than the kind of traditional museum goer. And we've been here doing this ever since. We're going on 50 years now. Since the museum is open, how has it evolved and changed over the years? Just, you know, from the obviously what you do in the museum and how you teach things like do you I obviously have two main rooms that are the exhibits, but how have they just evolved over that time? So the second exhibit room was actually added in the 1990s. So that was kind of the first major change to the museum. And that room was actually originally storage. It was our stock room. And the idea was we wanted to expand the museum, but we're located in a historic building. So um, adding exhibit spaces kind of uh, calls for creativity. But uh, the idea was there's so much more to the story. Um, Salem actually comes towards the end of the witch trials era. Uh, witch trials really end, you can say, in a legal capacity in the 1750s. So 1692 is really kind of squeaking in towards the end of the period of legal witch trials. So we really wanted to kind of take a step back and focus on how we get to Salem in 1692 and then how the idea of a witch has changed and evolved over time. Uh, and that was really the first major step of the museum towards pivoting from just this presentation-based organization to an education-focused, mission-centered museum. So um, we added that second exhibit, and as time has gone on, um, we've added other things like information panels in the front of the museum. We translated the presentations into different languages to make the museum more accessible to uh, international travelers. And then we, in the past 10 years or so, have really been seriously working towards evolving the museum in a deeper way. So um, the main presentation really hasn't been updated since the 1970s when it was created. There have been small changes over time, but it's really in desperate need of a huge overhaul. There are so many things that were true or believed to be true in the 1970s that we have since learned because of the growth of scholarship um, are not accurate anymore. You know, we've learned so much about the Salem Witch Trials since then, and we've been trying to update the main presentation for about 10 years now. And the first time we tried to do the main exhibit update, the front of the building started to fall off and we had to channel resources into fixing that. The second time we tried to update the exhibit was last year, we were it on track. We had the money lined up. We had the finances, we had the contractors, we had um, a timeline in place. The idea was to have everything Thing finished and done for our 50th anniversary, which is next year. And then the pandemic happened and all of the money that was going towards that update has been channeled into just keeping us afloat over this last year. So it is going to happen. We are going to update that main presentation. Gosh darn it if it kills me. But uh, again, it's going to be put off for about a year or two, hopefully no more than that. But uh, before the pandemic struck, we were able to update the second presentation, which much like the first, just had some older scholarship in there that we have since learned is not accurate. So that was my baby. Uh, I worked on that for a couple of years and we got in there, did the interpretive update, changed some of the figures, added an audio narration, put in a timeline, 
added some new artifacts. All of this happened on March 13th of last year, and then the state and country shut down two days later. So um, beginning to think that this process is a little cursed, but you know, we're, we're making our way through and we're continuing to evolve and grow. And um, you know, we just gotta keep pushing forward and um, working to make the museum a you know, better, more impactful place. I gotta say, with all that happening in the mention of curses, was the ghost that Giles Corey saw right before the pandemic came? No, and the curse of Giles Corey is one of my personal hatreds because that ghost story is so, you can tell exactly when it was made up and by whom. It was in the middle of the 20th century. It's one of those ones, there's so many spooky things about the Salem Witch Trials that at least have a basis in the real history. And the curse of Giles Corey was just completely made up by somebody and we know exactly when and where. So that's one of those things that makes my inside scream. <laughs> I, I always laugh because I've been on the walking tours and that's like always the biggest point. And I was just like, is he really that mad at the town? Wouldn't he just be mad at the people that pressed him? Well, and the whole thing about the curse of Giles Corey is um, and historians, I've talked to Marilyn Roach about this, who's one of the kind of major historians of the Salem Witch Trials. You know, if you're being pressed to death, the ch chances of you being able to formulate a full sentence, pretty unlikely. The chances of you being able to say, I curse you in all of Salem. I mean, let's suspend reality and say he does say that. It's not recorded in any of the primary source documents. There is no record that that happened. So it's one of those things that, you know, it gets made up years later. It's because he has such a gruesome death that naturally attracts ghost stories. But, but specifically, that story is so ridiculous <laughs> and so specific. If you take ghost stories around Salem, you will hear that stated as fact, regardless of how loudly I yell about it. <laughs> Well, now it's out there on a podcast that people can listen to year after year. So, sorry, Giles, your, your curse, <laughs> your curse isn't real. But you know. I, I was gonna say I want to talk about something that is very real, which is the the growth of Salem as you know a tourist attraction. It's become maybe the number one place in America for the Halloween season. How many visitors does the museum see in a regular October? Obviously pandemic withstanding because that's going to skew it a little bit for last year. It's honestly really hard to say. Um, you know, I can say that we offer presentations every half hour. We can fit approximately 100 people in the presentation per half hour. And throughout October, we offer those presentations starting at 10 a.m. and concluding sometimes at midnight, at least on the weekends. And they are sold out the entire time it is and it, it you know it fluctuates year to year but um so you know you can do the math there but it's a it's a whole heck of a lot of people um salem itself sees um crowds that just continue somehow getting bigger every year even though the city really we're starting to run out of infrastructure to handle the amount of crowds that come but it's kind of like it's something we can't put back in the box at this point you know people love halloween and they love salem and they're going to come to salem no matter what even last year with the pandemic we were way too busy considering the fact we were in the middle of a very serious global pandemic so i i think people's love of halloween might have got a little bit much because uh you know i was one of the many people who stayed put but then i saw a lot of people traveling because you can go on youtube and you can see salem travel blogs i'm just like when i saw the crowds even on like halloween and the weekend before i was like oh man it was a little unnerving <laughs> to be honest but um our executive director is amazing and she really took all of the possible precautions and Nobody on our staff came down with COVID during October, which I think was kind of a miracle in many ways. But um, it was, it definitely took a year or two off all of our lifespan, just dealing with that insanity. <laughs> but we came through it and it, I think it was kind of a good bonding experience at the end of the day. That's great because like a lot of businesses disappeared and like obviously museums were one of the things that people couldn't go to. So do you want to talk about a little bit of how you pivoted to online and digital? 
Yeah, so that was really, you know, I, I hate to use the phrase the silver lining, but one of the kind of good things to come out of this horrible situation was we were forced to adapt to uh, a more virtual platform, which ended up being incredibly successful and has made our museum considerably more accessible to people who can't travel even in, you know, a normal time. Um, so the kind of first step we took in that direction was while we were still shut down, I hosted a series of live streams on Facebook every Sunday, just about topics related to witchcraft. So we talked about the European witch trials and the Salem witch trials and the trials that took place in Hartford, Connecticut and the evolving image of the witch and things like that. And we ended up having this really fun community that came every week and they ended up being considerably more popular than we could have ever imagined, which was kind of as we were all in lockdown, just, you know, scared and feeling very isolated. It was a really nice way to kind of feel the Salem community in a virtual space. And then that kind of snowballed into offering virtual special events in October. Normally we try to do one or two events in person in October a season. Um, and this year we just couldn't facilitate an in-person event. We were having trouble just getting through being open regularly. So we hosted two virtual events and they were very successful. In fact, we had too many people who wanted to come and our Zoom license couldn't accommodate them, which was great, you know? So we, uh, you know, we ended up really feeling encouragement that way. And then I started doing virtual talks for groups that were interested in having a speaker and also student groups. So we had had a Skype in the classroom option years ago that was never particularly popular. But this year, um, having a Zoom in the classroom option has become enormously popular. So I've done uh, like three, four, five Zooms a month every month since January in classrooms all over the country and um, even in countries outside of the U.S., which has been really neat. And we've just continued doing our virtual events. We did one that was extremely popular in February about race in the Salem Witch Trials and how contemporary conceptions of race influenced the events of that year. And it was free and virtual. Now it's up on our YouTube page and we're going to do another free virtual event in August. So, and if the pandemic hadn't happened, we may never have taken those steps to make ourselves that virtual. So um, it's been kind of an ongoing learning saga, but I'd say that's actually the kind of silver lining of this whole monstrous year. <laughs> it, that's what I like to see, because uh, I talked to Kay Lynch, who does Salem Horror Fest, and she had to do the same exact thing because she had a whole festival booked. Yeah. And then... You can't do an in-person festival. So she ended up like really, really having to pivot and go virtual and all that. And I think she's keeping that component as well, even though I think Salem Horror Fest is coming back at least sort of in-person this year. Yeah, I think we'll keep virtual events in October just permanently because honestly, it's, it's really kind of difficult for us to, you know, uh, at the end of a long day, ask the staff to stay here, set up the chairs, set up the podium, sit through an event and then break it all down so this way it's just me and a computer which is honestly much easier for everyone so and we we had a much larger audience than we normally would have had so I think we will keep that going forward at least for October when someone visits the museum ultimately what would what would you and your colleagues like that person to get out of that experience so the mission of our museum, our mission statement is to be the voice of the innocent victims of the Salem witch trials, while also bringing a awareness to the root cause of witch hunts, both historically and in a contemporary sense. So that's really the big piece we want people to take away is understanding the kind of humanity of these events, that these were real people who, you know, had families and lives and you know, they weren't monsters either. The people who accused them of witchcraft were real people who uh, were afraid and made a terrible, terrible mistake. And that's, that's really important, especially when we're talking about witchcraft, because it's so easy for us to think of the 17th century and just go, those silly Puritans, they were just dumb and ignorant and barbaric. And, you know, we are so much more evolved than they ever were. And that's, it's really not the case, unfortunately. So we, the way we end our second exhibit, which you'll know if you've been to our museum, is with a witch hunt wall. 
where we provide a formula that can be used to break down the events that happened in Salem during the 1692 witch trials, but also um, contemporary events. So that formula is fear plus a trigger equals a scapegoat. And we uh, talk about that in the context of uh, of course, the McCarthy blacklists in the 1950s, which was made so famous, um, or at least so famously conflated with the Salem witch trials, thanks to Arthur Miller and the play The Crucible. We also talk about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II and the scapegoating of the gay community during the AIDS epidemic in the 80s. So this is really what we want people thinking about is this formula of behavior is something we still see today. It's something that we see happening right now. And it's really important for us to learn about in this context because that's how we stop it from happening in the future is um, you know really understanding it being able to identify when we see scapegoating taking place and being able to kind of pull ourselves back from that kind of knee-jerk reaction to look for a group or a person to blame so that's really what we want people to walk away from the museum carrying with them and i think we do a pretty good job conveying that message so is the latest scapegoat that's causing fear and paranoia of mail-in voting that's you know there's so much <laughs> it's it's hard to even nail it down at this point but we actually in 2017 started doing this project uh, where we've been asking visitors what they would consider fit the formula so we've been giving out postcards at the end of a visit and you can fill in blanks of the formula. And then uh, if you mail it back to us, or if you go to our website, there's a page where you can fill it out virtually. Um, we've been posting all the results online filtered by month. So you can see how our visitors, which is not limited to just the United States have been thinking about this formula and applying it to modern day examples and historic examples. And that has been very enlightening. Um, it's been a really interesting process to watch. We actually have um, two professors who work for a university in Texas who are analyzing the data for us and are going to publish a paper about the results and what we can kind of glean from the way people react to this formula. Some people really understand it, some people really don't. And I think it's it's been very enlightening and also a little depressing, but, um, you know, it's getting people to think about it in terms of today. And that's, you know, the bare minimum what we can ask. On a much little bit lighter note here, <laughs> Salem has a few celebrated films set in the town uh, and obviously books because you have Nathaniel Hawthorne, House of Seven Gables. You also have The Crucible, which is based on the witch trials as well as, well as the McCarthyism. But, you know, Salem... It's probably best known because Hocus Pocus, Lords of Salem were shot there. But there was a film production that predates all, well, at least those two movies. It's from 1982. It was directed by Bert I. Gordon, a.k.a. Mr. Big. It's a movie called Burned at the Stake, a.k.a. The Coming. And what makes this really unique is I think almost the whole movie was shot in Salem. You get to see the... You get to see the town cemetery, and you also get to see inside the Witch Museum, which is a really, really surprising and rare thing to see on film. Obviously, you weren't on staff when the film was being made, but could you tell us what you know about the museum's use and participation in this film? Sure. So um, Burned at the Stake or The Coming is kind of the, the famous lore of the museum. You know, everybody has to watch that movie at some <laughs> point because it's it's kind of a ridiculous film, but in like a really great way. Um, I love that movie. Uh, our friends at the museum, we will do like movie nights and watch The Coming just because you can't get enough of it. We actually have a, um, a movie poster from it displayed in um, our museum store. We have a movie poster display and The Coming is one of the posters up right now. So I asked our executive director before uh, coming into this interview what she could tell me because she was not here yet, but she was hired the year after it was filmed. She says that she remembers they wanted to film a murder in the museum. So um, if you've seen the movie, you'll know one of the kind of main characters gets clonked on the head in Old Bearing Point Cemetery and dies. Uh, and they wanted that to happen in the museum and the museum said no because they didn't want to film a field trip going awry in the museum and not the best PR. <laughs> so that's kind of the big thing that they remember from it. Um, I think Lori Cabot was asked to consult on the movie so she was involved to some degree. 
Um, and yeah, that's it's kind of fun watching that movie because you can see uh, not a lot has changed in our main auditorium, but things have changed. Like when The Coming was filmed, uh, you stood in the auditorium, there was no seating. Um, and I believe also there was still the blue lit circle, which is now a red lit circle. So um, that's kind of the fun uh, watching now, you know, is kind of it's kind of fun to see those little changes that have been made. And also the the climax of the film, the big like the spiritual saving of the little girl from being possessed yep. happens in the museum. And it's a really yeah. effective, <laughs> it's a really effective scene because the um, I'd say the Lori Cabot stand in is like in the middle of that blue light circle and it's just yep. it's great it's if for those you who haven't seen the movie it's on youtube i'm pretty sure it's a lost movie kind of in the gray area limbo of like films that are i don't want to say lost because there's it was released there's probably someone's got a 35 millimeter print but like no one knows who owns the rights and it hasn't hit dvd or blu-ray yet so i i'm hoping by mentioning it here and showing that there is some importance, at least to the town of Salem, that someone tries to find it. Yeah, we we, uh, we have tried to find uh, copies because we don't have a copy of it owned by the museum. Um, and we've tried and we haven't been able to find a physical copy. Even finding the movie poster was kind of a big task in and of itself. So if somebody out there has a copy, <laughs> we would love to have it. Where can people find the Salem Witch Museum in person as well as online? So in person, we are located right in the middle of downtown Salem. We're at 19 and a half Washington Square North. And yes, our address is 19 and a half, which I have no idea why, but it's, I think, kind of fitting for us as an institution. Um, and you can find us on Facebook at Salem Witch Museum and on Instagram at Salem Witch Museum. And we do also have a website, which is SalemWitchMuseum.com. We're going to take a quick commercial break, but when we return, we're going to talk about a different kind of museum in Salem on the Cinematic Void Podcast. At 6 a.m., most of Salem, Massachusetts is still asleep. For Lori Cabot, it is the time when the day begins. For Lori, witchcraft is not something dark and secret. It is power and a knowledge to be shared. She does so every morning for a Boston radio station. It's Laurie Cabot's daily witch report. So let's find out what's happening out there, cosmically speaking, with the good witch of the East, Ms. Laurie Cabot. Good morning, Laurie. It's Friday, June 20th. Good morning, everyone. The moon is in Libra, and the emphasis is on good manners, consideration, and tact. Venus, Saturn, and Neptune are harsh today, so her feelings are bound to happen. Just bliss out and fantasize a lot and wear rainbows. This is Laurie Cabot, a good witch from Salem. Remember, every ending is a beginning. And for all of us, this is law. Where we enter in, from there we must withdraw. Bye-bye. Welcome back. We've been talking about Salem, Massachusetts here on the Cinematic Void Podcast. And we just did an interview with Rachel Christ from the Salem Wish Museum. But now we're going to be talking about a different kind of museum. And... We haven't really talked about like what to do in Salem in general, but like there's a lot of museums. There's like a pirate museum. There's like a bunch of different variations of which museums whose accuracy is. What's with the pirate museum? Pirate museum because New England used to be a hotbed for pirates. Like Salem used to be a bigger port than Boston. Gotcha. Like way back in the day. And like there's, you know, pirates and privateers and stuff like that. It's like basically just listen to a running wild song and you get the picture. Okay. I, I don't know it, if you don't know what Running Wild is. It's like a German power metal band where their whole fucking theme is like privateers and pirates. Maybe not specifically about Salem, but just about pirates and privateers. And from our fog discussion, neither of us are big pirate fans. Not the baseball team. <laughs> I did like that first Pirates of the Caribbean movie when I saw it. I actually like that ride at Disney World because it's, it's just a slow ride and just like just kind of cruise through. It's relaxing, but whatever. Let's get back on topic here. But in Salem, there's a ton of museums. There's a ton of like tourist trappy things. Like there's just shit wax museums. There's like they've now like there's a fucking Harry Potter theme store. I think there's two of them where they sell wands, which like I don't know what the fuck Harry Potter has to do with Salem, but 
I mean, at the same time, what does Halloween have to do with Salem? So I guess... Get that paper. Get that paper. And I think one of those Harry Potter stores has a fucking Ouija board or spirit board museum in the back of it. I mean, there's, you know, you have witch shops, you have all kinds of stuff. But our next guest actually runs a really cool horror-oriented museum. It's called Count Orlock's Nightmare Gallery. And I remember going to it at its old location back in 2008. It used to be across the street. I mean, not directly across the street, but pretty close to where the Pirate Museum is, which is off the main drag of Salem, like in town. Like the main drag is Essex. That's where the Peabody Essex Museum is and like... All that stuff. It, it's part, like, there's this red line you can follow to go to all the different things. Like, the Witch House, which... Uh, Witch House is really cool to look at. Witch House is, like, the only house that existed or still standing, or one of the few that's still standing, that was there during the witch trials. No, no witch or accused witch lived there. I think it was one of the judges that were the, was doing the trial. But the house is really cool. But back to what we're talking about is... Count Orlock's Nightmare Gallery. And basically, it's not a wax museum, but it has a bunch of really awesome full body figures of, you know, different monsters from the beginning of horror, the silent era to modern times. There's like Christopher Lee Dracula. There's a werewolf from the howling. It's just, it's really cool. You can't take any photos or videos in there, which I don't blame them because like if you get that shit out there, it kind of devalues it. But it's one of my favorite places to visit. And I visited when it was in an old place. And it, I think maybe in 2017 or 18, I can't remember from the interview, but it moved to Essex Street. So it's now on the main drag in a much bigger building. So it has more eyeballs on it. Thanks to Kay Lynch, she put me in touch with James Leggio, who's the owner and curator of um, the Nightmare Gallery. And we had a little discussion on June 25th, 2021, where we talked about the museum, running a business in Salem, Again, COVID comes up because it came up in all these discussions. Because look where we're at still. Anyway, but it's really cool. He James gets into his history of like getting into monsters, getting into collecting, getting into building this museum. So why don't we just check it out right now? Joining us now is the owner and curator of Count Orlock's Nightmare Gallery. Please welcome to the void, James Logio. James, how are you doing today? I'm well. How are you, James? I'm doing well. It's, yeah, we have this name doppelganger thing. I hope we don't get confused with each other. And I start I will definitely get confused with you. I, this is, I already feel a sense of confusion. <laughs> well, let's just dive into this whole confusing Q&A of two people with the same name. Uh, could, you, <laughs> could you tell me how the Nightmare Gallery came to be? Sure. Let's see. Shall I start at the beginning? <laughs> the beginning is always the best spot. The beginning. Well, at the, when I was a kid, uh, when I was around 11 or 12 years old, I visited a home haunt in my hometown of Jamestown, Rhode Island. And this home haunt was about as professional a haunt it could as it could have been. It was run by a guy who was about 10 years older than I was. And uh, it was free and he collected donations at the end. It was all run through his yard where he lived at his parents' house and they let him do just amazing things in this plot of land right behind the supermarket, the only supermarket in my town. And this was very well known in my town. Everyone knew about it and many, many people and kids and certainly adults went to it every year. But that was the year that I, that I discovered. It must have been sometime in the late 80s. And... Uh, I was fascinated. This thing was amazing and it was beautifully done and it was uh, dynamic and you could tell even, even I could tell at my young age that there was a lot of imagination that went into it. And shortly after that, I called, I, um, I asked my parents if I could call this guy because again, small town and my parents knew his parents, so that was no problem. So I called and he was nice enough to invite me over for one afternoon to see the collection off season. And uh, I arrived that day with my brother to make sure he wasn't a creep, uh, this guy. And he was a creep, but in the best possible way. And uh, his name was David, it still is David uh, to this day. And uh, he's, he was the super nice person that kind of took me under his wing to show me how to, how to collect, how to be discerning about monsters and showed me his collection. And that day he gave me some catalogs to start collecting. And from then on, I saved my paltry allowance to buy monster heads and various different strange props. 
and that was how the collection started. And the collection grew into a collection that was used in my haunted house. I teamed up with a friend of mine, Seth, through junior high and high school, and uh, we did haunted houses those years. And that was a lot of fun. We did them in the same town as David, so people had two haunted houses to go to. Mine was done inside, his was done outside. It was this fun thing. And then I did one year in college and I took three seasons off and uh, jump a bunch of years. In 2005, I was asked to do something called um, Hallow Screen Park. And this Hallow Screen Park was owned by this guy who I hadn't met yet. And uh, they wanted me to put a small monster museum together for it. And I said, sure, I can do that. It would be small because at that point, my collection was mostly monsters that you see behind me. Um, the audio won't do this justice, but there's mostly imaginative monsters behind me, not from movies. And, uh, but I put this museum together in 05. I did the same in 06 and 07. And at somewhere in there, I said to the owner and my friend who introduced me to this guy, I said, you know, I'd really love to put down roots somewhere because this thing that we're doing, which is bringing my huge collection to the Boston Bayside Expo Center uh, over the course of a maybe a week, setting it up into a space that was really uh, pole and tarp, you know, for like conventions. So I was bringing my, the first time I brought my collection in 05 up to the space, I put it all together and it was, you know, at that point, I was, however, whatever age I was, it was in my late 20s. I set up this thing and I was uh, leaving it for the night in Boston. And I lived in Newport at the time. And I had a panic attack, nothing huge, but it was something like, oh my God, I just left my whole collection with virtual strangers in Boston. And uh, there's nothing to guard it. It was this enormous, the Bayside Expo Center is this enormous uh, arena space inside. Um, and there was just pole and drape guarding my collection. <clears throat> it turned out to be fine, but that was my first time just leaving everything. I did uh, the shows 05 and 06 uh, as well, 05, 06 and 07, excuse me. And uh, like I said, that year uh, or one of those years, I asked the guy who owned the, the, uh, the place, I said, you know, I'd love to put down roots somewhere because this is taxing, taxing for my my father who was helping me, taxing for me, stress level. And it just doesn't make any sense to bring my collection to a different state. And he said, well, you know, I have this place in Salem and it's, uh, it's an attraction and you should come and see it. I said, oh, okay. So I went and I hung out the day there and uh, I saw people come in and see the attraction and I thought, huh, this is interesting. It wasn't exactly what I imagined, but this is very, very unique. And I started to get my wheels turning. And he says, you know, if I did this, you can do this. I said, oh, really? And that's almost all it took. A little bit of coaching from him, uh, a little bit of insider knowledge from him and other people. And I set up the museum in a space on Derby Street in Salem, uh, 285 Derby Street. And we opened September of 07. Uh, that year, my collection was displayed at that museum and also at the Bayside Expo Center during the month of October. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And then of course, the next year was all in Salem and we've been there uh, in Salem since that year. And we moved from that space to uh, a bigger space on Essex Street in uh, 2018. And we've been there ever since too. And that's, that's essentially how we came about. That's what I was going to ask you about, because I, I think I'm pretty sure I went at least in 2008 to when it was off of Derby Street, which is kind of near the Pirate Museum. And then you, you moved over to the new location, which I went to as well in 2018. And I was going to ask, was it because the collection was getting too big for that space? It was actually getting too big for that space very early on. Um, as you may know, and and many of the people who have gone to the museum uh, have known, the collection is always expanding. I've never stopped collecting. And sometimes I, uh, I add three to six new characters or exhibits every single year. The space that we are in or and have been in, we've always just tried to work with it, <clears throat> figure out new ways of displaying things, just make sure that the experience is as good as it possibly can be because people look like looking at a lot of things. It's, 
at least in my experience. We moved because in the summer of 2017, my landlord uh, said, we may need to do something different with the space. And uh, we never had any contract. It was just a verbal contract. And uh, that was dumb, but it was, it, un it ended up being great because I thought, well, it's either I close and it's, and it's his whim. He's going to toss me out to do something else. That was a very vague thing that he said. And then, and I said, oh, or we can move or close. And I, we, we had a couple of options and, and both of them were daunting. So in, in, um, in that time, uh, between the July, late summer and, and the fall, I found a place on, on Essex Street. And I always said, if I ever move, it would be at Essex Street. And it had to be a bigger location because Nightmare Gallery's always been a lot of fun, but people always want more. It's, we, could, we could have an enormous, you know, 15,000 square foot, square, uh, square foot warehouse. <clears throat> that was well done. Um, but it's not ever going to be enough. But I said, we have to do a bigger space. So we did a bigger space. So it's much, it's more than twice the size. And, uh, and the reason is because the, the landlord just said, I wanna do something different. We had a great relationship. We've always been uh, very functional and he still has an empty space, which is kind of funny. I was going to say the other advantage to moving to Essex Street, because it's basically the main drag of Salem. It, for those of you who haven't been there, it's a kind of kind of brick like walk area. And like there's a lot of things to do. There's obviously all the witch shops and like all the T-shirt shops. And I think there's a Rite Aid or a CBS there, too. But like, do you think that location has helped bring more eyes to the gallery? Yes, it's in enormous because it's always seemed that Derby was central, but I was on Derby and that's that was my, that was in my head. Essex Street is the center. And uh, what I found is anyone who made them their way down from Essex Street, that was like it was the runoff, it seemed the, the main body, the main uh, tourist uh, is stays on Essex Street or you know, along Essex Street and various different streets off, off, off of Essex Street. But Derby Street is definitely secondary. So we have found that the, uh, the, the, that way more people have come to the museum. I mean, we always get, is this new? And I say, well, it's new to this location, but we've been in Salem since 2007. And so many people are surprised that they've never been. You know, horror movie fans evidently didn't wander off of Essex Street before. I mean, rather there have been horror fans that have never wandered off of Essex Street. So we're getting a lot more people in, which is wonderful. It's done so much for our business. And as having been to both locations, I think it's much, much better off on Essex Street. Something I want to ask is like, you have a lot of kind of custom figures, like full body figures. How do you acquire those for the museum? So I've been collecting these things for 30 years and they sometimes come in component parts, a head, a couple of hands, uh, sometimes one hand, sometimes a claw. And uh, then it's a matter of me putting it together. Sometimes it's a matter of someone else has done that before I came to acquire it. And sometimes it's a matter of, this, of the, the best possible scenario, which is a full figure done as is that I just simply have to put in the right light in the right area in the museum. The acquisition is, is really very normal. It's asking someone if they can make one of these things or occasionally I buy them from a different, another collector that I know because I know a lot of other collectors. And uh, sometimes we have things uh, commissioned from scratch uh, to go in the museum um, or they, they have the mold and they are they simply make one for the museum. But many things have already been there for, for ages. You know, I would say that the oldest thing in the museum that I think I have is uh, probably the, the werewolf from the howling. It's kind of peeking up in back of the front desk. And that goes back to, oh, I'd say probably 85 or 86. But that's something that I bought from another collector that ended up being in the museum. But we're always getting new things and always look for things that are already full, full figures. 
but again, the, the the budgets and everything has to align. You know, we we try to pay very close to close attention to what we add and what we've already spent, et cetera. You know, it costs a lot to rent one of these spaces uh, in Salem, especially one as big as the museum. What are some of your favorite exhibits in the gallery? Is there certain figures or pieces that you really love that like you find yourself just wanting to go look at during the day, even when you're working? Well, <clears throat> for, for some reason, it's always the newest ones. Although I do have my old favorites. One of my new monsters is, uh, is this wonderful Mary Shaw from, uh, from Dead Silence. Um, she's just so creepy. She's the head was made by a company out in LA and she has Billy right in front of her. Uh, if you haven't seen that movie, I don't know if you have, um, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Personally, I, I enjoy it. That's one of my favorites. I, I also, um, I don't know, there's a ton of favorites, but in, in many cases, it's like picking my favorite child. You know, there's wonderful new villains, wonderful old villains. I do love my mummy, my Boris Karloff mummy there. I've worked a lot on him. There's, there's ones that I've worked a lot more on than others. Um, and sometimes those become my favorites as well. I was going to say, what are some figures you would like to add to the gallery that you haven't had a chance to as of yet? Well, the ones that are most called for on a regular basis are Leatherface and Jigsaw. And the reason that they're not in the museum, as people can guess, is because they're not some of my favorite franchises. I'm sorry, my cat is right behind me. <laughs> I'm being nudged by her. She's just like right here. But I do want to get those figures as I do have an appreciation for the movies. They've just not landed on my collection for whatever reason. You know, sometimes they just, it takes a while. And uh, because they're not in the collection and other things that sometimes people ask for in the collection, it gives people a reason to come back year after year uh, to find new things. And that's sometimes the reason that they come several times a year. And that's actually kind of smart. Build that anticipation for people to come back and see that thing. I'm sure that whenever you do get a Leatherface, the Gunnar Hansen Leatherface, obviously, Yes, we, we speak none about the other ones, but <laughs> I, I'm sure people are going to be really, really happy now. Yes. Now, besides, you know, the museum itself, you've hosted events and, you know, signings with like actors that have been in some of the movies. Do you want to talk about some of those events you've hosted? Sure. Well, the first one we ever did was in 09. And that was uh, Tony Moran, who played Michael Myers. In the first movie, he played the face of Michael Myers, where Jody, uh, um, Jamie Lee Curtis rips off his mask, and that's that's Tony underneath it. And we've had Tony back a number of times. We've also hosted Kane Hodder uh, many times as well, who played Jason, and of course Victor Crowley, uh, and a bunch of other movies. We've had D. Wallace. Some of the ones that have come to mind that have kind of popped by, which are fun. Uh, Rob Zombie pop popped by. A um, couple of times back when he was filming The Lords of Salem, we were talking about that before the interview. Adam Sandler popped by. Uh, Rachel True. Gosh, there's, there's, there's just a ton. You know, one time Kane was there doing a doing a, an autograph signing, and <clears throat> he's always been a great sport. Um, he'll 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 he's he's just a wonderful, fun guy. And uh, in between signings, he's like, James, I want to go in the haunt because we used to actually on Derby Street for the weekends in October, we used to have a haunt, a haunted house there. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, Kane said, I want to go in the haunt and I want to, I want to be station, stationed somewhere and scare someone. I'm like, oh, OK, <laughs> So Jason comes to me and says, I want to scare someone in your haunted house. You say, OK. And I put Kane in the spot where. Uh, people always punch, it seems like. There was this one first spot that people always just threw punches. And uh, not that everyone threw punches, but it always seemed to be the one that, that, that you'd have to dodge a, a, a fist. And I put Kane in this coffin right there, standing up in this coffin. And I quickly realized that he was too broad to be in this kind of toe pincher coffin up against the wall. And so I had to place him elsewhere, but it was a lot of fun and because it, you stood right next to it. And after that particular tour, I, I did hear the uh, father of some little boy uh, point to Kane, who was outside already, and say, see that? That man is Jason Voorhees, and he just grabbed my face in the haunted house. <laughs> and I'm like, you grabbed his face? He's like, no, just, just, just barely grabbed his face. It was a lot of fun, though. We, used to, we had a wonderful time. 
uh, hosting celebrities. We and we haven't yet. Actually, we haven't um, last year, and we won't. We don't have anyone booked this year, and uh, it, that's mostly because of of COVID. We have a lot of fun when people come and sign autographs, but it's it is mostly just for fun. It's it's not always the the most fiscally appropriate thing that we do uh, for the museum. It is it is definitely for the fans, and we have a lot of fun with it. That's that's awesome. Now, speaking of fans, Halloween is probably your most busy season in Salem. What's it like running the Nightmare Gallery during that time? It's very, very busy. It's just insane. You have to be there all the time. Oh, if if you if you care about this sort of thing, you have to be at your business almost every day in October. Occasionally, I have found pockets of time or a day or two when I can take the day off. It does depend on the help that you have. And I have several extremely competent, irreplaceable individuals that work with me, uh, one main one. And uh, this is the first year out of 14 years that I felt that maybe, just maybe, I can skip a little bit more of October uh, than I have in the past. Not that I want to skip it necessarily, but when you have kids, do you have kids by any chance? I don't have kids. I have two cats. That's about as many cats or kids I need. I, I totally get that. Uh, we have two cats ourselves, but they're very low maintenance, you know. But when you get a, a child, or when I get a child, when I found this wonderful boy uh, that came into our lives, I found the reason to go home. Uh, not that my husband wasn't a good enough reason before, but there's this little guy that you get to spend time with now, which is just kind of wonderful. But in terms of, yeah, what it's like to run an attraction in Salem, it's just very, very busy. During COVID was even busier because you couldn't, like our attractions always had a line and many times line down the block. When I moved up to Essex Street, it had to be shorter. And we've never really had to deal with that. People are mostly self-contained in the, in the, in the queue line there. It works out very well. But during COVID, we couldn't have more than five groups in line at a time and we couldn't go past the end of the building at the front of the building. And that's so hard. It was just so difficult. So, um, but we figured out a way of doing it, but I had to be there all the time. So there's just not one person outside. It had to be two, myself and another guy helping me at the front of the line. I was the, the, the line guy, one of the line guys. So it's, and of course the, we were at 25% capacity inside. So we had to carefully very click people in, click people out and make sure that we didn't have more than a certain amount inside the building, which made it very spacious for tours. <laughs> uh, that was one thing I would ask from everyone I've spoken to that works and lives in Salem during last year is, <laughs> you know, did I, you also did online ticketing and reservations and that kind of stuff for the museum during that time? We did, yeah, we did switch to online ticketing, which was absolutely essential. I was kind of afraid of that before, but it's not as much work as, it, as I thought it was going to be. People could pick a time slot and decide when they were going to visit the museum. And that worked out beautifully. We didn't overstell it, not only in October, but the rest of the year, because we're open 10 months a year. And do you have people that specifically come to Salem just to go to the museum? Have you found like people like that? Definitely. Um, a lot of people uh, do that. They, they come to the museum, but of course you can't just do the museum. It's a wonderful uh, town to spend some time in. The museum is, is uh, it's a lot of fun, but it really only, if you, if you spend some time in the museum, you could probably spend an hour or more if you wanted to, but most tours, most tourists, I should say, uh, visitors spend between uh, 15 to 35 minutes or so. And uh, you can certainly spend more time in there. You can spend hours if you wanted but that's what generally the the amount of time that people's most people spend in, in there so there's always something some more time to fill um salem's a long trip for most people to get into salem just off the highway is another 15 to 20 minutes so you got to make it worth it so yes while there are people who come to salem just to see the museum their days are often filled with other attractions which is definitely a good idea now with covid winding down at least according to everything right now how do you perceive Salem's going to be for this year in 2021? Everyone is saying that it's going to be a crazy year. I'm not even sure what that means. I think perhaps people uh, who didn't get out last year are just going to need it this year just so badly. They've spent 
all their money on this fabulous costume and they never got to use it last year. So maybe they want to use it this year. Uh, maybe they just, uh, they had a staycation last year. They were just trapped inside their homes being uh, good, good people and didn't, uh, didn't leave their home. So they need to leave this year and they need to have some Halloween fun. I, I know that there are people who did that and they just did not do much last year at all. Many, many, many people, I'm sure. So they're going to want to do something this year. And I believe, uh, I believe they're all headed for Salem. What does the future have in store for the Nightmare Gallery? Do you foresee that you're going to have to move to a bigger space eventually? Or are you just going to take over the Peabody Essex Museum, just fill it up with figures? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a lark? <laughs> um, I, you know, the future is is something I I uh, I don't I don't see it. Uh, it's very very cloudy. Who knows? I always tend to be an optimist. But the fact is that the building that I'm in is owned by another person, not by me. And uh, the person that bought it um, about a year after we moved in bought it for a song and he's a uh, developer. And I say, I say developers, there are some really good developers. He's not one of them. And uh, he has expressed interest in, in taking my space over, but I have a lease, of course, that lasts years and then a three year extension after that. So. I'd like to get at least 10 years out of this space. After that, I don't know. I, I, would, I would like to say that I will have energy and, uh, and uh, will to build another attraction, um, either in Salem or some other place. It'll be more along the, the same lines as Nightmare Gallery, but, but uh, I don't know. I'm 43 right now. I don't know if I'll have the energy to do that in um, another six or seven years or so. James, where can people find Nightmare Gallery online as well as in person? They can go to nightmaregallery.com, uh, which will give them links to our social media. They can also go to 217 Essex Street in Salem, Massachusetts. And that's where we're actually located, where they're likely to either find myself or my assistant Cliff uh, and greet us and say hello. And we will do the same back. Awesome. Thank you for your time, James. Thank you for, for, uh, for, for the opportunity. We're going to take a quick commercial break, but when we return, more Salem here on the Cinematic Void Podcast. At Mikey Discount Muffins and Brakes, we fix exhaust, shocks and brakes in all cars, SUVs, and light trucks. We'll give you a free estimate before any work is done, and all work is performed to the highest standard. We'll even check your brakes to make sure they're safe. I know some of you may be wondering about the unicycle in this commercial. Have you ever tried to stop one? Meineke Discount Mufflers and Brakes in Salem and Lynn. Are you sure those are the right kind of shoes for that? Unbearable suspense keeps you on the edge of an abyss of terror. Take a cold film odyssey into Cinemadness with Cinematic Void. Based in Los Angeles, Cinematic Void is a film series that specializes in horror and exploitation films. Currently, we are hosting Cinematic Void Up All Night in the Cinemanus Movie, a monthly virtual screening series, as well as the Cinematic Void Podcast, where we dive deeper into the world of cult cinema. You can find Cinematic Void on the World Wide Web at cinematicvoid.com, as well as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you like what we do, you can support Cinematic Void by joining our Patreon. Until next time, See you in the void. Welcome back. We've been talking with a lot of people that work in Salem, running film festivals, museums, that kind of stuff. But we, outside of my own personal anecdotes, we haven't really talked to someone who's there covering and documenting it. And, you know, a few years ago, as I mentioned early on in 2018, I went to Salem on Halloween. And before going, my wife and I decided to start watching some vlogs. And... I'll be honest, I'm not big on people's vlogs because I feel like a lot of them come off condescending and like, you know, there's supposed to be like, a, you're supposed to live vicariously through some of these people and just my number one takeaway from a lot of them I'm seeing is like, you're a fucking asshole. <laughs> and I just, I just want to fucking punch you. However, we did find one guy who actually made really entertaining vlogs, who's actually personable and... This is the biggest thing. I think when people make vlogs, you're supposed to live vicariously through them. This is a little different. This guy 
makes his vlog so you feel like you're there with him, like you're hanging out and like you're just there for the adventure, which is like we talk about in this discussion that I had with him. But like it, it's this thing that like it's being personable and having a personality and just like feeling genuine and not like just putting on some bullshit for the camera. And that gentleman is the guy named Derek Millen and his YouTube channel Detours. Now, Derek does a lot of like vlogs. He's done Disney. He's done a lot of like history around Boston. He's done a lot of like tiki bars and stuff like that. But he came on my radar because of his Salem vlogs. And they're really fun. He's a great guy. Like my wife and I love watching him because it's just like, again, just hanging out with someone, stopping and getting a drink, you know, like basically how I would do a vacation or have I done a vacation or how I've actually interacted in Salem. Like you go, you shop around, you look at things, you stop, get some food, fucking have a drink or two, go out, have another drink or two, you know, just having fun. And that's why I love Derek's vlog. So I reached out to him to see if he wanted to talk about, you know, covering Salem and all that. And he agreed. So this discussion is, you know, about him and his Salem vlogs, but it's also about how he got into vlogging. He's also a big pop culture guy. So we talk about him going to pop culture conventions and also being a big horror fan and growing up in the 80s and like getting into like horror movies and stuff. So without further ado, this is from discussion I had with Derek on July 8th, 2021. And it's a, you know, again, talking about Salem, talking about horror movies, talking about pop culture and talk about the best place in town to go grab a drink because that's important. If you don't drink, it's also the best place to go grab some food. So here it is, Derek Millen of Detours. Joining us now is the creator of the YouTube channel Detours, where he vlogs his many adventures, including in the beautiful town of Salem. He's also a pop culture enthusiast. Please welcome to the void, Derek Millen. Derek, hey. how are you doing? Hey, Jim. Good to see you, my man. Good to see you, too. I've been excited to talk to you because, you know, I've seen your videos pre-pandemic, but like through the pandemic, it was a nice way to live vicariously and getting to see Salem, which is one of my favorite places to visit. But obviously, a little, little difficult last year. But before we talk about Salem, I just want to ask you, how did you get into vlogging? About six years ago, I came across some um, YouTube channels, Adam the Woo, Justin Scard, both from out where you're at in LA, uh, World of Micah, Casey Neistat. They're just going around documenting cool places, you know, Hollywood, Disneyland, movie filming locations. I said, I think I can do that. I don't have the, the backdrop of Hollywood or Disneyland anywhere near me, but I do have a really cool city up the street about 25 miles known as, you know, Salem, Massachusetts, Halloween capital of the world. These guys are doing what they're doing at Disney World, Disneyland. I think I can do the exact same thing but do it in Salem. I, I was watching YouTube and I'm not seeing too many channels that are documenting Salem. So I said, what the heck, I'll run with it. I'll make Salem my thing. And here I am. You know, it's awesome because there aren't a lot of videos about Salem and when they are, they just don't really capture the spirit of it. But before we kind of get into Salem itself, the, the thing I really like about your videos compared to a lot of vlogs that are out there, they seem very well put together. They're nicely shot. They're nicely edited. Did you take any sort of video editing courses or videography courses before you started vlogging or did you just learn from watching other videos? Nope. I had a, I had an audio history in my past. I was a radio disc jockey in college. And then for a few years off to, after college, I was doing radio as well. But as for video, I taught myself, I do all this stuff. I edit it and film it all on the iPhone. I taught myself how to edit. I do it. I edit as I'm going. So, you know, you see in my videos, I'm filming stuff and I'll go and stop and have a beer. When I have that first beer, I'm starting to edit down those first 20, 30 clips that I filmed already that day. Finish that beer, go out, see some more sites, have another beer. Then at that second beer, I'm editing the stuff that I filmed between those, the first beer and the second beer. All done on the iPhone, no expensive cameras, no expensive audio. Don't even use a, a gimbal or a... Uh, a selfie stick the kids might say i don't know just just hold the camera and just walk and that's that's basically what the vlogs are that's pretty impressive i gotta say because like i've actually been video editing for about 21 22 years and i was you know that's one thing i do really like about your videos because they're well put together and the fact that you're basically editing them during beer breaks it just makes it more that more that more impressive i'm using the free software that apple provides you on the iphone the iMovie so i just uh dump the clips one by one into the uh, editing software and just mosey along my day. If I plan it right, by the end of that particular detour that I'm filming, I'll have that thing pretty much edited by the time I get home. Again, I'm impressed. As someone who's been editing for 20 plus years, that's 
no matter what you're using, you're doing a hell of a job. So I just want to commend you on that. I appreciate that, Jim. Thank you so much. People always ask, what kind of camera do you use? What kind of equipment? Honestly, again, just the iPhone. It's not about the equipment. It's about the content that you're creating. I mean, you can use a potato if you can film a video with a potato, as long as you're filming interesting stuff and, and you're you know coming across as interesting to the people that are watching your videos. The other thing I really like about your vlogs is that your personality shines through. And it feels like... I mean, there's a lot of vlogs where people are just kind of talking at you, showing you what they're eating, they're, the things they bought. But like it, your videos feel like you're we're actually hanging out and going and doing all this cool shit together. Is that a conscious approach that you had or was it just something you kind of discovered as you were making these? So, Jim, what you see is what you get on these videos. I'm, it's, there's no acting at all. I'm just being real. It's all about being real to the people that are watching your videos. Make them feel like they're with you. Um, if you notice, most of my friends are not in the videos. Some do tag along. A lot of them have families and kids so they can't go out and do random stuff with me. So it's almost like if they want to sit, Derek, I wish I could live vicariously through you. Well, you're doing that with the video. So it feels like you're with me on the video, but you're really not with me at the video. Make any sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Now, the first detour you actually did in Salem was, I think, detour number 24. And I know you did a couple other places. I think you started in Disney World, correct? The first detour was, yeah, detour number one was, uh, I went down to Disney World. That's, again, that, that, that's how I started with the vlogs. I was watching guys that were doing Disney stuff. At that point, I hadn't been at Disney for maybe 20 years or so, so it was my first time back. After that, I moved to do local stuff around Boston. I went to the Sam Adams Brewery. I did um, Six Flags a couple of times. And then once I started feeling more going back to that Salem well, that's when I was getting a lot more viewers, a lot more comments, a lot more people digging the video. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to run with this and people want to see the Salem stuff. So that's what I want to give them. We talked about this a little bit before we start recording that there are a ton, a ton of people covering Disney, but there's no one that's actually regularly covering Salem. And I, that was what I was, was going to ask you next. After you did this first video, yep. it was, did you kind of notice the instant uptick in viewership because it was in Salem? It was probably my second or third Halloween night in Salem video is where I started seeing a lot more traffic. Okay. So the first one wasn't well produced. Um, I, it's not one of my, I go back and it's cringeworthy to watch now, but um, I think I've definitely grown since that first Salem video and made it my own. But yeah, I think it was after maybe the second or third Halloween and then um, filming the haunted happenings. I really wasn't doing too many of those. I believe the first year. It definitely wasn't my first Salem video. It was, it was several Salem videos after that where I started getting the traction of being the Salem guy. So after you did Detour 24, you went back to Salem on Detour 31, but this time it was during Halloween in Salem. And I think according to the video, you said it, that was your first time actually experiencing Halloween in Salem. What was that like? I think it was my first Detour um, on Halloween in Salem. I did go the previous year. And I wasn't vlogging that. I was just taking photos of the event. But that was definitely my first, I believe, I believe the year before I didn't, I didn't, I definitely didn't film a detour. I believe I was there Halloween night the year before. I think Detour 31 was my first time filming in Salem on Halloween. I've never experienced anything like Halloween in Salem. For those of you who are at home who've never been to Salem on Halloween, could you share what exactly happens on that night, Derek? just so they can kind of get a little bit of a taste. Obviously it goes to your videos, but like, you know, more so about the energy and like the amount of people and the costumes and the borderline chaos with everything. <laughs> so the method of the madness, I get there super early. I'm there between 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning, Halloween morning, just to make sure I get my parking spot. As soon as I'm getting to the streets, Jim, there's already people in costume at 9 a.m. walking around. There's yeah. street figures out, there's beer gardens, you know, a little bit later in the afternoon, live music stages. So it's almost like a, it's like a, a, a Halloween festival, if you will, of all the activity. There's definitely a special kind of electricity in the air on Halloween in Salem. I mean, there's not electricity any time of year in Salem, but in October, throughout the whole month of October, especially on the 31st, I mean, did, you, you, you can't bottle that energy, man. It's just something I've never, ever experienced anywhere else on Halloween. 
And having done a couple Halloweens myself there, I agree. It's it's experience like none other. Like, you know, I live in L.A. and I've been out on Halloween in L.A. And, you know, no offense to where I live, but it just doesn't reach what Salem is. And obviously Salem's got a little more history and like it is Halloween central. It's it's it a really, really great place to be on Halloween. I call it Halloween town. And it's amazing. How many people that I come across on the streets who watch the videos who are from different countries, different parts of this country. I, I meet a lot of people from the, the Massachusetts area, but I meet a lot more people from California, Texas. I've ran into uh, a couple ladies from Australia a couple of years back and spent the whole day walking around Halloween and Salem with them. People are coming from near and far to enjoy Halloween in Salem. That was the next question I wanted to ask you is that you've actually inspired and met people who have seen your videos and booked a trip to Salem just based on seeing them. How does that feel for you that to know that like your work is reaching people like that and they you're inspiring them to like take the trek there? I got into these videos just to have fun. I didn't think I was going to be inspiring anybody or having anybody plan their trip around anything that I ever created. But once someone stops me and said, we're here, not only because of Salem and the history and that Salem provides, but just because your videos make this place so much fun and we're here because of your videos. I can't describe the feeling. It's, it's different than falling in love, you know, with somebody. It's a, it's a, it's a whole different, it's a whole different monster. People are there because of my videos. It's crazy. I didn't think that anybody was going to be watching these videos, let alone coming from out of the country to come visit a place because they saw me film there. It's just crazy, Jim. I mean, it's amazing. And again, this goes back to earlier, we talked about you being yourself and your personality carrying through the actual videos. I think that's what draws people in and they see how much fun you're having just walking around and stopping and getting a beer here and there and, you know, just showing the sights, sounds and all the great things about Salem. It's, you know, it, you're a good salesman, I should say. <laughs> and let's just put this on record. Salem has never, ever given me anything for free. They don't, uh, provide any kind of hotel or transportation. I don't need that. I only live about a half an hour away anyways, but they've never given me any kind of kickbacks. This is all, this is, I'm just doing it because I dig the place, you know? Nobody's hooking me up with anything, except for the, the viewers of Detours who uh, stop and thank me for, you know, for the videos and, uh, you know, buy me uh, a beer or something to eat. It's, it's, a, it, it's, it's such a feeling, man. I can't believe that someone is actually visiting someplace because of my videos. It's, I just can't, I, again, you ask me how it feels, I can't explain it. I can't explain it, really. It's flattering. It's an honor. And I'm so happy that when people do stop me, again, I didn't think I was going to be getting any traction from any of these dumb videos, but here I am getting stopped all the time. I love it. It's definitely an ego boost. Now, has anyone in the town of Salem ever approached you after seeing your videos? And what is, I guess, people that live there's reaction to your the content you create? The... Uh, the, some of the restaurant owners love it because <laughs> my videos have brought a lot of pat patronage into their into their restaurants. I have had comments in the videos from locals, you know, stay away, stay away tourist. All you do is bring traffic and, and trash to our town, which I can't believe they would say that. They're, people are bringing money to the economy in Salem by, you know, by coming and visiting all the, the history and going to the restaurants and checking out the museums. I don't know, maybe they're just old school old school residents who just don't dig the month of October in, in their beautiful city. I don't, I, I don't know. It's, I hate when I get those comments, stay home, tourists, stay home. We don't want you here. They obviously don't own any business in Salem. No, they don't. Uh, we have a term in LA for those kind of people. We call them NIMBYs, which are not in my backyard, which are people who are just grouchy when anyone encroaches and does things that are fun and like, you know, it's just, just angry, bitter, but for lack of a better word, assholes. Yep, yep. I don't hey. want to call anybody ever an asshole in my videos, so I'm not going to do it. I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you go ahead and say it. <laughs> <laughs> Any hate mail for me re referring to grouchy fucking Salem residents who don't like tourists, who don't like bringing money to their economy, since basically, and all the businesses I've talked to that run Salem, like their biggest time of the month is obviously October, a little yep. bit of September. And so that I mean, actually the beginning of November too. Yeah. yeah. Which is funny. Cause I used to, when I went to Salem before moving out to Los Angeles, occasionally I would go the first week, of November, and it used to be dead. But the last time I went, I was still there the first week, of November, and it was still packed, which kind of 
proves there's a big spillover that like people just like being there regardless if it's Halloween or not. Obviously, Halloween's the draw, but that's a cool town to visit no matter what time of the year. I mean, I've been stopped in April, people watching the videos. So, you know, most people come during October, obviously during the fall, changing of the uh, seasons, the, the leaves falling, just the atmosphere, the mood and atmosphere of Salem. But people are coming all year round in this place. But you're definitely seeing more foot traffic, obviously, in the fall. And that's what I recommend coming is definitely during any time in October, you know, between the 1st and 31st, you're not going to have a bad time. You're going to see the people in costumes. You're going to have the street vendors out there selling all their awesome Salem merch. And the, the fireworks and beer gardens, all that stuff doesn't happen until in concerts. They, they don't happen until uh, Halloween night. But you're still getting a plethora of excellent activity all throughout the month of October if you're visiting Salem. Now, we were just, you mentioned like different seasons. You actually started covering Salem in those different seasons. I think you do it winter, spring, and summer now. Did you start doing that because people were demanding more Salem content? And obviously, you can't just wait till October to film a bunch of videos. Or was it something you were interested in covering as well? Or was it a little bit of both? It was out of curiosity. I wanted to see how Salem looked, you know, in December when the snow on the ground. Obviously, now the last couple of years, definitely last year, it actually snowed on Halloween. So, was able to kill two birds with one stone on that holiday but i wanted to see document salem different different times of the year besides halloween just to see how it changed how the foot how it looks on the streets with less people for taking photos you know there's something different of taking a, a picture of a cemetery in the winter than there is in the summer so i just wanted to experience before that i was just going only in october and also quite frankly jim people weren't watching my disney stuff they weren't watching me walk around showing boston history I wanted the views back, so I was like, let's go back to the old well, let's go back to Salem, and it doesn't make a difference what time of year, as long as in that, the thumbnail's got a picture of Salem, and I mentioned Salem in that title of the video, people are going to watch it. One thing I want to suggest to people listening, and like, obviously, you should check out Derek's Salem videos, but your other videos are just as fun and, and as engaging, like, it, you know, you've shown a lot of places in Boston, like, you know, I haven't been to Disney World in years and my wife and I watch your episodes and are like, shit, maybe we should go because basically you make it look fun. So I'm just going to encourage everyone like, yes, watch the Salem videos, but check out everything Derek's making because it's it's a lot of fun. You get to see a different perspective. And again, like I said, your personality shows through. You make the videos very engaging and very watchable. Thank you so much jim yeah i besides the salem stuff like i love uh you know i wish there was more views for the uh the pop culture conventions i go to i've met you know celebrities i met the cast of the goonies cast of the back to the future movies a couple of years ago john travolta i met keith sutherland so i'm having all these interactions with with these celebrities in these videos too and those ones they kind of slip through the cracks maybe people don't like pop culture as much as i do but i, I have almost just as fun maybe some i always say Halloween in Salem was my favorite day of the year, but then Rhode Island Comic Con comes and I'm like, Rhode Island Comic Con is my favorite day of the year or Boston Fan Expo. Boston Fan Expo is definitely my favorite day of the year. So there's, there's a lot more to the Salem stuff. In fact, I'm proud of the, um, you told me um, off camera that you watched uh, my detours from last, last March when I was cruising the Norwegian breakaway. I filmed that, that was right when the um, whole pandemic started. I was on the ship when all everything was going down. In fact, I was in Mexico, double fist and some Dos Equis and people are calling me, you know, do you know what's going on right now? Like, yeah, man, I'm on spring break right now. I feel like it's, <laughs> feel like it's 1997 again. They're like, no, America's closed down. You can't buy toilet paper, Disney World's closed. They're closed in schools. I was like, well, I can't do anything about that right now from Mexico. It's Thursday, I'll deal, about, I'll deal with that on Saturday when the ship lands, if I get off the ship. So. Video, my videos are covered more than just sale. You're also going to see me during a, the beginning of a pandemic on a cruise ship, which is pretty crazy. I, I do want to, I wasn't going to mention those videos because like it, but since you brought them up, the, the thing I liked about them, especially watching them now that the pandemic is not fully moved on, but has altered enough that, you know, world is reopening, but like, it's, it's almost like a really nail biting thriller because you're just documenting it as everything's unfolding. You don't know if you're getting off the boat, you don't know what's happening. And it's like, it's a very real video. You know, it's like, I'm experiencing the pandemic from just staying in my apartment. You're out of the country on a boat, not even sure you're going to be allowed to dock and get off that boat. What was that experience like? So going into it, 
I think I purchased my ticket and maybe it was uh, beginning of February for this March cruise. And we were getting rumblings about the pandemic starting, you know, over in, uh, over in China and whatnot. And then uh, it's, it's never going to reach here. And then you start seeing what well, I forget the name of the cruise ship with all those people that were stuck on the boat for all those days. Here I am with a ticket for a cruise. My people I work with, my friends and family, you sure you want to get on this thing? You know, what you get yourself into, I, I didn't think it was going to be as, uh, I didn't think it was going to be anything like what it turned out to be. I don't want to say I was scared getting on the boat. I definitely was in the back of my mind, but I'm thinking about Jamaica and Mexico and Grand Cayman. And I'm not thinking about, you know, a coronavirus or anything like that. It started getting real about Wednesday. I wasn't watching any news on the boat, but once I started getting, like, the text messages and um, DMs about what was going on, that's when it got real. I didn't know if I was going to get off the ship. I was supposed to go visit my parents after I got off the ship. They told me to go directly home. I was quarantined for, you know, those two weeks once I got back to Boston from that ship. So it was definitely a crazy time. I'm just stuck. I'm just glad I wasn't stuck on that, in that ship, in that, uh, in that balcony suite for uh, two extra weeks without getting to leave and get some buffet or have a cold beer. <laughs> I don't think I could have survived. I mean, I, I'm going to recommend people to check out those videos because like, if you want to experience like, what could have been a really, really bad scenario for anyone to live through. Like, like I said, it's a nail biting thriller. Uh, I did want to jump back to your but talk. I, I still showed the fun time that you can have on a cruise ship again, keeping the pandemic knowing about it, but just kind of keeping that in the back of my mind, but definitely towards the end of that cruise, it started getting real. And once you start like when you watch, I think it's a five episode series around episode four and five, that's when you start definitely it becomes a nail biter and like what's going to happen to this guy. We talked about your, you know, being on a cruise ship when the pandemic started, but you also documented Salem during the pandemic itself, which was, I, I'd say it's a unique experience, one that I hope isn't repeated, but like, I think at the end of the video, you're just kind of sad because of just how it was, because, you know, COVID took a lot of things away. It took lives and it just kind of like changed, you know, being able to enjoy like basic things like, you know, having fun on Halloween. What was it like for you actually documenting Salem on Halloween during the pandemic? So I'm, I'm proud of those videos. Yeah. Um, a lot of stuff was closed off obviously during the pandemic, but I still wanted to show people who couldn't make it to Salem, who weren't allowed to come to Salem because they were from out of town or you weren't, you know, you didn't have your test or whatnot. I still want to show you the experience of what was going down during the pandemic. A lot of things were closed. Yeah. We were wearing masks. It was definitely a total different time, but I wasn't going to, pretend that Salem still wasn't there during October. Salem's still going to be there. You're just not going to get the bells and whistles of all, you know, the beer gardens and the, the live musicians and the, the great characters out in costume, working hard for those photos, collecting those tips. You weren't seeing any of that stuff, but I still wanted to bring to you that Salem was still there. Talking to everyone from Kay Lynch, who does Salem Horror Fest, to James, who does Nightmare Gallery, to um, Rachel Christ, who works for the Salem Witch Museum, and you as well, the way the pandemic shaped last year and how like they had to figure out new ways to do stuff. And I think you just documenting this is how Salem is during Halloween is a way to just show like this is how the, to the town survived in well, many ways. Showing how the time, how the town survived, I was also showing all through October, like the, the evolution of the steps of what they were going to be doing on not to let you come here, how they're going to be blocking roads down and, and, and closing parking lots at noon and no train service. I was showing in real time what the city of Salem was, was doing to protect all the citizens of Salem from, you know, people coming from out of town and possibly getting them sick. So it was, it was a very real time. Again, I wanted to show you what was going on during well, I want to see haunted happenings, but haunting happenings wasn't existing last year. I still want to show you what was going down in Salem October, but I also wanted to give you the facts of what was going on in case you wanted to come to town. Like if you, I want to drive up from New York for Halloween weekend. Well, there's a chance that you're not going to be able to park. There's definitely a chance that you can't get a restaurant reservation or checking any stores or museums. I wanted to, I want to stop you from coming before you got there and got disappointed, you know? I mean, being in Salem on Halloween during the pandemic, and what was that like? The Halloween this past year in Salem was definitely different. It was really cold. It snowed the night before. James Bond, Sean Connery died that morning. Again, a lot of the streets are closed. A lot of the stores are closed. If you wanted to go to a store, you had to wait in a line socially distanced, obviously. They weren't letting too many people in at a time. 
restaurants you had to have a reservation for. You just couldn't wait outside of Rockefeller's hoping to get, you know, a great hamburger. You actually had to pre rearrange a, a reservation to eat that day. I had three different reservations. I, I couldn't just show up and want, want to eat. Museums, again, I had two or three different tours that day. I had to book. I think I was able to book some that actual week, but I wasn't trying to be that guy to show up in Salem with no tickets to anything and then just being let down. It was still a great day. People still came out. It wasn't as, you know, the thousands and thousands, uh, I don't want to say hundreds of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people that show up during a, a normal Halloween, but there was definitely people still out there in full costume, enjoying the sights, the sounds, the smells of a, of a, of a Salem Halloween. Again, watered down. 2021 is definitely going to be a, a whole lot different. They want people to come. This is the year to come back to Salem. So I'm hoping to see a lot of you guys who enjoy my uh, videos. I hope I hope you guys make it out there this year. I'd love to, to love to talk to you in person. I do want to jump back to the pop culture conventions yeah. because I do like those videos too. Because like, you know, you besides covering like Salem, you're a very huge pop culture enthusiast. You have tattoos, you go to those conventions. When did you start going to those kind of conventions? Uh, even if it's pre-detour, obviously. It was definitely pre-detour. It might have been around the year 2005. I was living in North Carolina during uh, college years. And then for, for five years after college, I had moved back to Boston um, in, in 2003. I think around 2005, I got wind of this convention called Rock and Shock Horror Convention in Worcester, Mass., where it was it was my first convention of these types where – it was celebrities. There were, you know, obviously everything you find at conventions, cool tables of just weird stuff you wouldn't be able to find it. You know, the Natick Ball um, posters, uh, old school uh, action figures, all that kind of, you know, cool stuff. But it was only horror. It was only horror movie um, actors that were at these things. And yeah, most yeah, it was all. In fact, it was definitely all horror movie. There wasn't any um, any. I wasn't seeing John Travolta there, put it that way. But um, yeah, I think the for one of the first celebrities I met was um, Roddy Roddy Piper. He put me in the sleeper hold at my very first convention. He actually put me like he had to hold me up because of my body went like it was, it was a real sleeper hold. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say Roddy, one of my favorite wrestlers. Actually, yeah. one of my one of my favorite actor wrestlers too, because he was in John Carpenter's They Live. He also was in Hell Comes to Frog Town and sorely missed like when we were doing beyond fest year two we were supposed to have roddy piper there with keith david for they live and he oh, unfortunately that's the, that's the best fight scene in all movies yeah <laughs> it, it really is it the bummer was that he passed away before we got to do that show so like i that was one of the things that i was really excited for and just didn't happen but like i know you're a big you're a big pro wrestling pop culture fan what what are some of the other your other favorite celebrities you've gotten to meet at these conventions. So I don't know if you watched this vlog. I don't even remember what number it was, but it was definitely my all time favorite celebrity encounter. I was meeting the great Barry Williams, of course, Greg Brady from the Brady Bunch. I was at uh, super mega fest. I forget what year it was. I think it was probably my second or third year of doing these detours. I'm now in year five or six. So it was, it was three, three, four years ago. Got that classic photo with, uh, with, with uh, Greg Brady, where I was wearing the, he put the tiki. Remember that episode of the Brady Bunch when he's surfing and he had the tiki on his neck? Yeah, the cursed tiki thing, the right? Tiki, everybody in the Brady Bunch, you know, Peter, I think, had the spider. And Alice threw her back out doing the hula. Um, you know, all, everybody had, you know, some kind of bad luck on that trip. Anyway, so pitch, I, I get the picture with Barry Williams. I have the tiki around my neck. Thank him. Walk away. I'm doing more vlogging. I get back to the car. I realize I'm still wearing this tiki. And I'm in possession of, I don't know if it's the real Tiki or if it's, you know, just some knockoff that he brings for these things. I, I figured the like Indiana Jones would say, like, the real one belongs in a museum, right? So I'm sitting in the car with this Tiki. I go in back into the hotel, have a couple drinks. And I'm filming this as I'm going, saying, yeah, do I return this? Is it the real thing? What do I do? I love it. Have it back here in the pop culture shark bar. I did the right thing. I went back in, uh, got in Mr. Williams's line again. And he thanked me and confirmed that that was the actual screen used curse Tiki from that classic Brady Bunch episode. That was my favorite encounter of all the encounters I've had with celebrities over the year, other than being put to sleep by Roddy Pike. That's, that's a great story. I mean, you could, you could have actually been cursed. Imagine what would have happened if you took it home. Well, that's the reason why I did the, the, the right thing and gave it back to its owner because 
That's why I don't have any Ouija boards in my house. You know, it, it's a wise thing. If you're, if you're worried about Ouija boards, I know, you know, Parker Brothers, they didn't invent them, but they popularized them. Funny enough, Parker Brothers, as you know, originated in Salem and then moved out, which I think is funny because now I, there's also a Ouija board museum at, um, in Salem, correct? Yep, yep. It's called the uh, Witchboard Museum. Gotcha. And it's in the rear of a, what's it called? Remember Salem. It's a, a Harry Potter type store. It's all uh, wands and... I've never seen a Harry Potter movie, so I don't really know the uh, the terminology of all these knickknacks. But you walk in there, and it looks like you're walking into a gift shop at Universal Studios in the Harry Potter world. And the very rear of that store, you walk through a little doorway. It's ten bucks to get in, and it's two rooms full of just Ouija boards all over the all over the walls. I don't even want to say what year the first one came out, but there's probably a few thousand different. Ouija boards in that room and they're all styled different. They all have different paintings, all shaped differently. It's it's definitely a, a, a cool place to check out if you're gonna be walking around Salem. Again, 10 bucks. But definitely not cool to take home because you never know. You never know. I do have I do have a magnet. I do have a magnet with a Ouija board, and then I have these uh I got a little tin of uh, some mints right here, which is <laughs> a Ouija board, but that, that's the extent. When I was a kid. And we were having sleepovers back in like 1984 or so, 1983. That's when I started first watching horror movies with my friends. We were actually messing around with Ouija boards back then. <laughs> we, we were in a lake house one night during Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts messing around with the Ouija board in this. And I swear, this cup flew off the kitchen table and across the room. I'm not making this up. It just it was... And after that, I've never touched a Ouija board ever again. You mentioned horror movies. I was going to ask you, since you're also, you know, big into Halloween season in general, what are some of your favorite, like, go-to uh, movies to watch during Halloween time? So I remember getting into horror movies probably around 1985. I remember having a birthday party. I actually have a, a picture of that party. I had a Ghostbusters cake. And I remember that particular party my parents let us watch Friday the 13th, part four, and the original first two, Face of the Death. Um, so that's kind of crazy being, what, 1985? I think I was I was born in 74, so you do the math. The first time I ever saw a horror movie, my, my dad just got a, he borrowed a VCR from somebody at work, and it came with a box of tapes, and I was able to watch that official uh, 1978 the, you know, the, the, the class of 1978 Halloween, the original Halloween, followed by Halloween 2. And then I believe the original Friday the 13th was also in that box. So started my love of horror movies watching original Halloween, Halloween 2, Friday the 13th, part one. Then I remember, again, 1985, maybe 19, I think probably 84 is when I started watching these movies. My parents didn't care. Me and my best friend Joe taking our bikes down to slow motion video and chorus line video and just going and renting horror movies from back in 19, you know, 1984, riding our bikes. Parents don't know where we are at the time, as long as we're home by dinner. But we come home with a bunch of obscure, different horror movies. And I can't believe my parents would just sit there and let us, you know, watch these movies, like, right in front of them. They didn't care. Like, sometimes, like, the lax parenting of the 80s that allowed people like you and I to watch things we had no business of watching at such a young age, it, it kind of molded us. In a, I'd say a good way. Do well, you think people our age, uh, you know, eight, eight or nine years old, should be watching Face of the Death? <laughs> now they don't know that most of that stuff was fake on those videos, but that's still kind of uh, strange for a uh, eight or nine year old to be watching at a birthday party. Yeah, that, that is kind of a weird birthday party pick, but like, yeah. but again, also the birthday party where we busted out a Ouija board too. So we were definitely weird kids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I think kids now would kill for a birthday party like that, or at least in our respective age groups. I don't know if new, new younger kids would be like into watching Face of Death and Ouija boards, but but as an eighties, probably watching like Stranger Things or something like that. Yeah, it's just not the same. Just or not. Dare say, or, or dare I say, Goonies. Yeah, it's not the same. Since then, I can watch Halloween, Halloween Two, any time of year. I probably watched the original Halloween. I don't know, 15, 20 times a year. Jaws, I can watch monthly. I'm watching the Friday the 13th series. A couple of days ago, I just watched that old movie, Zombie. I've checked recently checked out Grizzly, which is a Jaws knockoff. Definitely Jaws on land. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Shout out to the late William Girdler, who made two of the best Jaws ripoffs. One's Grizzly, the other is Day of the Animals, which if you haven't seen Day of the Animals, all I'm going to say is Le- Leslie Nielsen wrestles a bear. Leslie Nielsen's in that movie? Yeah, it's um, a, beer, a, a bear. Yep, it's a Day of the Animals um, uh, label that I work with a lot. Seven Films just re-released that Grizzly and that on Blu-ray, but I think you can probably find them on Amazon Prime too, but definitely check out Day of the Animals. All I got to say is there's a lot of things that happen in this movie, but Leslie Nielsen wrestles a bear. That's all you need to know. I have uh, all the streaming services that you can think of. So, you know, the last year or so, I've been checking out any kind of old school horror movie that I've never saw in any of those old school um, video stores back in the 80s. I'm checking them out now for the first time. So it's a it's continuing this journey of horror. It's, it's, it's a great time. As someone who works in the business, like this has been a really good time for like a lot of those movies that kind of got lost on the VHS shelf to come back. Now they're getting newly remastered. You get HD versions. It's, it's, it's a really great time to be a horror fan. I'll say. And then also with the pandemic, everybody's sitting home. It was a great time to sit home and watch something that either revisit something that you loved back, you know, when you were a kid or discover new stuff that you never even knew existed. And there's some crazy titles out there. Talking about your favorite movies, you mentioned Jaws. And yep. I, ble- I believe last year you went to Martha's Vineyard and did a, I guess, a location tour of Jaws, which so, is, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that that right there is hands down my favorite detour that I've ever filmed. And, you know, I've done all the pop culture stuff, and the Salem stuff and the cruise ship stuff, Disney stuff. But going back 45 years later to the, the, the town of Amity, you know, Martha's Vineyard. That was my first filming location for, for a movie. And just, a, and it's my favorite movie of all time. So stepping foot into the actual town of Amity was, it, it was beyond real, man. It was like an out-of-body experience. I love filming all the locations. I came up with that idea like the day before I went. Yeah. Wow. I, went, I, I was like, I was watching Jaws. I said, I think I can go do these. And then I think I can do this location. So then it just res- for like the next hour or two, it resonated in my mind. I was like, I'm going to go do this. So I took it to Instagram and, and Facebook, uh, asked people if that's something they'd be interested in. And uh, I got on a ferry the next morning, stayed there overnight, went to all the locations. Believe it or not, nothing really has changed too much, except, and, I, I, and I've gotten about 50 comments about it. When I got to Chief Brody's house, I said, here is the original Chief Brody's house. Clearly, I wasn't watching the movie and I didn't have it on in front of me. It, it was definitely the same plot, you know, the, the same location. The house was definitely renovated and, uh, you know, maybe even torn down and rebuilt. Uh, it didn't look like the, the house in the original movie or in part two, Jaws 2, but it was definitely the, the scene. But people jump on back. That's not the original Chief Brody house. How dare you put this in the video? You're not a real fan. All right, man, uh, you go through your own video and you put that part of your video. There's a beauty to the internet that it connects people. And then there's a dark side of the internet where people just feel like they have to mouth off. And it happens yeah. on all spectrum of things. And 45 years later, things are going to change. Things are going to get upgraded, you know? Exactly. Quince looked exactly, well, they knocked it down, but Menenska, the uh, fishing town there, looked exactly like it did in 1974 when they, when they filmed the movie, 1975 people just need to let it go i mean yeah it's like i i love location places like you know obviously live in la there's a ton of places which kind of leads me to what are some places that you haven't been to yet but are looking forward to in the near future doing a detour of so you and i talked a few days ago off camera um i gotta i gotta go i gotta go to to pasadena to check out the halloween filming locations there's just so much stuff. I've never been to Hollywood in LA. There's just so much stuff out there that I want to get on film. Is there any other like kind of like spooky season places you go? I think someone requested Sleepy Hollow to you. Do you have any plans oh. on che- checking that out at some point? Sleepy Hollow is definitely on my radar. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try. I'm gonna be busy in in October in Salem every week. Um, I'm gonna try to hit up Sleepy Hollow um, in September. I've been doing my research on it. You know, I I obviously knew about it from the movies and from the story and stuff, but I didn't really read too much about it other than, you know, what I saw in the movies. But um, I'm definitely going to hit up Sleepy Hollow this year. Also, I would love to, sometimes a couple of times a year, they open it up for tours is the original Camp Crystal Lake over in uh, in New Jersey. And also another place, Jim, I'd like to go check out is um, 
the original like real location and the filming location of the Amityville Horror. One thing I wanted to ask you about is you made a lot of videos about Salem and you're going to continue to make a lot. Are you running into any challenges in trying to create new content? Because if you haven't been to Salem, and this is for those you who haven't, it's really a small town. A lot of the places you can't actually film in. And then all the there's other places you can go to, but they're not within the town. You actually have to drive out your way to go to it. Do you find yourself trying to figure out new ways to cover it? Yeah, I definitely need to. Um, I get, my history is Salem. I just walk around and read plaques. That's where I get my knowledge from and maybe occasionally surf a wikipedia site i do go back to the well for the same old stuff but people enjoy that so i keep on uh, going back and filming i just won't maybe i'll put the videos together differently so i'm not following the same path in every video but yeah like you said a lot of stores and museums you can't film inside of i'd love to go inside there and document it and bring it to the people that are enjoying these videos so much but unfortunately they just don't want you filming inside the stores or the museum so my hands are kind of tied with a lot of locations in Salem. And like you said, it is a small area. So what I'm walking around documenting is besides just walking through random neighborhoods and looking at awesome houses and architecture, you're seeing what Salem has to offer in the videos that I'm showing you. Again, other than some of the stores I can't go inside of with the camera or the museums that they don't want you documenting. There's some great attractions in there, great haunted houses. Unfortunately, I can't film inside those places. I was gonna say Count Orlocks. That's my favorite attraction in Salem. I go there several times a year, even when I'm, I, I go to Salem without filming videos too, but Count Orlocks, it's the it's a history of horror basically in wax statues from, I don't know, 1910, 1920, all the way to current day. Great, great stuff in there. They don't want you filming. Now, this is the most important question about Salem. Where's the best place to get a beer or a cocktail? <laughs> well, it depends what kind of drinks you're looking for. Um, I usually, uh, my favorite place, and again, I'm not being endorsed by this bar at all. I, I love going to Rockefeller's. It's right there across the street from the Samantha from Bewitched statue. It's conveniently right there at the end of Essex Street. Um, before you hit, I believe it's Washington Street. It's a great location, great beers, cold beers, great food. I also love going to um, the Village Tavern, which is right outside the Witch City Mall. And you can actually access that from the parking garage where I park at there at Witch City Mall. The um, Old Main Street Pub at the other end of Essex Street down towards Crow Haven Witch Shop. I love, um, oh, my favorite bar of all, of all time in Salem is the Floating Tiki Bar, the, the Tiki Bar off Blaney Street with Captain Scott and First Mate Karen. Yeah, I've seen the videos you've done on that. And like, you know, it's I'm not really a big going out to sea person, but well, they only take it uh, yeah. for an hour or so. And it's yeah. just basically as many drinks as you can drink in an hour. Of course, you gotta pay for each drink. They're not giving you free drinks while you're on the boat. It's 30 bucks gets you on the ship, and then it's like five dollars a drink. They got uh, good music. You get a good tour of sailing from a different perspective. You see it from the water instead of walking down the cobblestone. So if you're ever in town, I recommend hitting up that uh, tiki boat bar the tiki the floating tiki bar that's a that's a great that's a great time there's so many bars and restaurants in salem gym that i i can't even mention but um if you're looking for great pizza flying saucer pizza is my favorite pizza in salem uh, i love gulu gulu next next door for some craft beer but usually my go-to is rockefellers right there at the end of essex street i was gonna say a couple of my favorite places go is like I, i've seen you go in there once before i like opus which is kind of a little off the path this is like across the street from Kodo, the sushi place. They had a drink there called the Haddonfield, actually. I documented on one of my many, one of my Halloween detours. That's one of my favorite places to go grab a drink when I'm in town. I also love Flying Saucer Pizza. I know you're not a vegan, but I am. And I appreciate that they have a really, really excellent vegan pizza there, okay. which, which is like something I actually like about Salem that actually does better in LA. And I'm going to call out my town. It's like Salem has a better vegan selection than like out here now. Maybe one day I'll try that. I'm, I, I don't like vegetables, Jim, so everything is all is all meat and potatoes to me. So if they can give me a slice of pizza with a potato and a piece of steak on top, that's my that's my thing. <laughs> I was going to kind of wrap up talking about Salem with you here and just say, you know, overall, what does Salem mean to you as a place, as a state of mind, as a destination? What does Salem mean to me? Besides views from my channel, Salem is about like walking back into this, this old sea town of Massachusetts a lot of the stuff there looks like it did back in the day if you've if you've never seen Salem with your own eyes 
and only watch it through my video camera, you definitely go check it out. It's the, the, all the cobblestone and the the architecture and the color of the shapes of the houses and the rich history of 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 the witch trials and of pirates and sea life and the great food and again being stopped by fans of my videos that's what i love most about salem is i don't want to say being recognized and having my ego you know popping right then but just he, like bringing it back full circle just hearing from somebody that my videos have brought them to this location where can people find you online derek other than YouTube, which would be obviously YouTube, my uh, name, Derek Millen. I think you can actually put in detours in the search engine for YouTube and you'll come to my channel. Instagram, I'm at Derek Millen, D-E-R-E-K-M-I-L-L-E-N. Uh, I also have a Facebook group, Derek Millen's Detours. And you can find me at any of those locations. I answer all the comments. Or I try to answer most of the comments and all the DMs and in the, uh, the chats and all those different forms of social media. So definitely reach out. I love carrying on a conversation. I love hearing from you guys, either uh, on page or in person. So if you see me out in public, definitely come up and say hi. If you uh, want to send me some questions about Salem or anything about my videos or stuff about Boston, definitely drop me a DM on either one of my social media pages. And I love talking to you guys. So check me out everywhere. Thank you so much, Derek. Thanks, Jim. It was great talking to you, man. We're going to take one last commercial break, but when we return, it's going to be read, watch, and listen here on the Sin Mag Boy Podcast. Before you go out haunting this Halloween, why not come into our place, if you dare? <coughs> For all your Halloween haunting needs, theatrical makeup and accessories, consider, if you will, the j and Smoke Shop, 284 Moody Street in Waltham. Open 9 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Monday through Saturday, 12 noon to 5 p.m. on Sunday. Okay, Harry, grab the bed and I think we're out of here. Right. I want to drink your bag. Hi, I'm Harry. So am I. Well, there you are. You are not going to believe this. This Halloween repair is your Bud Supply. Pick up Budweiser, Bud Light, and Bud Dry. What's your Bud type? Welcome back. It's now time for... <laughs> ...on the Cinematic Void Podcast, where we talk about all the things we've been reading, watching, and or listening to. Now, because we recorded all these interviews in the past... I'm, it's not a really an accurate representation of our guests of what they've been reading, watching, or listening to, but what they were at the time of the recording. Up first is Kate Lynch. Why don't you tell us what you've been reading, watching, and or listening to? Sure. Um, okay, so the beginning of the year is always great because that's when I get to do all my reading. And then I get sucked <laughs> into the festival and I'm like, oh, how come all my books are only in the first months? Something that I really enjoyed. Well, I was on this big Val Luton kick this year. And so I read um, Dreams of Darkness by, what's his full name? J.P. Talat. Um, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, but it's fantasy in the films of Val Luton. So I used this as my guide to, you know, I had seen Cat People. Um, it's one of my favorite films. Um, and I Walk With a Zombie. But I had not seen any of his others. So um, I used this book as my guide to finishing the rest of his filmography and um you know I, I spent a lot of time reading articles and watching um and listening to audio commentaries on on the discs about his films and just kind of immersing myself uh in that so um i've been really uh digging that um for film i mean we're always watching films, so it's hard to, you know, it's hard to figure out, you know, what, what is one, you know, to, to point out, but I, I, I would say I had a lot of fun with Xena Dixon, um, whose YouTube channel, The Real Queen of um, Horror, she hosted um, a watch party uh, of Death by Temptation. Uh, that just had landed, you know, just came to Shutter this week, and so she invited myself and Megan Navarro to to participate and co-host it. And so um, I just, it's a really fun film um, that I'm so excited that more people are going to be able to experience. That's another film that I think 
kind of falls into the the gospel of George <laughs> of um, you know death by temptation is made by James Bond the third he's a prolific child actor who ended up making this film that he wrote directed produced starred in and it's got Samuel Jackson in it Bill Nunn and it's wild <laughs> it's just really crazy and it's a tight and, and it's like super low budget but it has a ton of ideas a ton of inspirations worn on his sleeve. There's Cronenberg in there. There's Fulci in there. Um, it's an all-black cast. It's just, it's a really cool film that I hope more people um, check out. And they can now because it's on Shutter. So yeah, for, for Listen, um, you, you know, it, it has a great soundtrack too. Um, but I want to mention that uh, we are hosting a virtual queer horror pride celebration at the end of June. And... Um, the theme is a killer prom and so we're creating this like virtual space that is like a horror prom but where music comes in is um you know we got gypped out of two years of pride like we haven't been able to go party march um fundraise i mean we can still fundraise virtually but there's just there's this huge um you know momentum of just community activity that comes every June. And part of that, for me, especially as someone who used to throw a lot of queer parties, is the music, is the dancing. And that's something that I feel like we all, you know, we, we're not going clubbing, we're not going to bars. You can be into, you know, uh, the, the music when you're alone at home, but it's, it's totally different. And so I created a playlist of songs that released in the last year that um, I imagined would suit a horror movie that takes place on a prom soundtrack. And, but also would be the type of music you'd, you would hear at Pride or you'd want to hear at Pride. So it's all this really upbeat, but spooky themes, <laughs> um, dance music um, called Fright Gown. And so I've been listening to that a lot just as continued inspiration for producing the event. But I hope that it can be something that since this is a virtual event, I mean, we're using Gather Town, so there will be ways to have these sort of real time interactions with people. Um, but I want the playlist to at least serve as a thing that everyone can refer to and have this sort of... <laughs> I don't know, there's, there's a feeling that comes with it. And if we can't dance, then at least let's listen to the same music together, you know, during this, this shared experience. Rachel Christ, what have you been reading, watching, and or listening to? So I love podcasts. I'm a uh, big podcast fan. So I listened to the last podcast on the left a lot, which is a great, um, you know, kind of horror, true crime, history podcast. I mean, in terms of what I'm reading, I, uh, I actually just finished my master's degree. So I am very joyfully reading fiction books. Um, but unfortunately, I can't seem to get out of witchcraft. So everything in my life seems to be revolving around witches. So I, I'm looking forward to the day where I have even fiction books that aren't about witches. But at the moment, <laughs> I don't buy the books for our museum store, but our assistant education director does. And she and I try to read all the books in the store as they come in. So I'm in the middle of the Practical Magic series right now, which if you have only seen the movie Practical Magic and haven't read the books, read the books. They're amazing. I would venture to say they're actually much better than the film. Uh, so I'm in the middle of that second book right now. Um, in terms of watching, uh, I, I just started Downton Abbey, to be honest, and I'm not loving it. But <laughs> uh, it's nice to be out of the 17th century, though, in a different period. So, um, yeah. James Lurgio, what have you been reading, watching, and or listening to? When we finally have free time, uh, we, we usually do the, the, the very noble thing of sitting in front of the boob tube. And not a lot of free time, to be honest. So reading is out. Uh, watching is, is always a lot of fun. But, you know, I spend a lot of time in and around horror movies at work. And uh, if there's one thing that's relatively universal with, I would say, most people is, is they probably want to leave work at work. 
weirdly enough, that has happened to me. Now, I love horror movies, always have and always will, but I don't spend all my time watching horror movies. In fact, some of the shows I've watched recently are uh, a wonderful show with Gene Smart called Hacks. Uh, we kind of streamed that. Uh, we've been watching um, A Handmaid's Tale and uh, RuPaul's Drag Race is about to come back. So we're going to be watching that as well. Mostly just interesting dramas and sometimes a supernatural thriller will come around, which, which I always enjoy. Horror movies for me at this point, for me to sit and watch them, there must be a supernatural element. I just don't have that much time to, uh, to dedicate to something that's purely blood and, and guts. There's so much that we watch, but it, it does have to be kind of special. We also have to agree on it. We only have one TV and that's on purpose. So we get to spend time with each other, at least watching TV. So, uh, and we can't always agree on what we'll watch. So we'll watch our phones and we'll put on Designing Women in the background. <laughs> Yeah, or Golden nothing, Girls. <laughs> you know, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that. No. <laughs> my my wife and I did a whole binge on Golden Girls probably maybe a year, actually during the pandemic. So there's nothing wrong with that. They can't be beat, those ladies. They cannot be beat. Derek Millen, what have you been reading, watching, and or listening to? Okay, so uh, reading is going to be very easy. I don't read. I'm not good at it. I get, bored. I get really bored looking at a page and... I. When I read, I feel like I read the same sentence or the same paragraph over and over because I get either distracted by like looking at my phone or I just can't comprehend what the page is saying. So to me, I, you know, I discovered audiobooks not too long ago. I know they've been around forever, but I recently, uh, last year I bought, you know, Peter Benchley's Jaws and I can't believe how much that differently that, that, that book is from the movie. I read it back in the day, but forgot about the whole mafia subplot and Ellen Brody, Ellen Brody cheating on Chief Brody with Matt Hooper, all that stuff that wasn't in the movie. I got uh, the audio book for Helter Skelter about the, the Manson trial, Amityville Horror. I have that audio book that I've listened to. I listen to a lot of podcasts, so I'm, not, I'm doing less reading. I'm doing a lot of listening to stuff. As for watching stuff, I've, I'm paying 300 bucks a month for cable, Jim, and most of the stuff I watch is on YouTube, which would be free. Um, so I'm watching a lot of YouTube. I get all the streaming devices. I'm watching a ton of stuff off of Disney Plus, like movies that I totally forgot that Disney released back back in the day that I watched as a kid, maybe Fox and the Hound and some of the great original content that they have. And, you know, I have Shudder, so I'm watching a lot of horror movies that I never heard of or didn't know about when I was a kid riding my bike to the, the video store. Stuff that's just like under the radar, was never released and is new. That's a great tool. Paramount Plus, you know, HBO Max, all that stuff. You can find horror movies and great movies everywhere. Uh, so I'm watching less TV and more streaming stuff. As for listening, I'm a huge Beach Boys fan. I'm glad that Sirius XM just released a brand new Beach Boys channel. It's all Beach Boys all the time from their early surf stuff through like their weird, you know, hippie stages in the 70s and, uh, you know, to their when they were older in their 80s and stuff. They play out great stuff. Listen to a lot of yacht rock. I dig, you know, uh, 70s, 80s soft rock. You know, that's, that's my thing. Um, Jimmy Buffett, huge Jimmy Buffett fan. So listen to a lot of Jimmy Buffett. I'm listening to a lot of Beach Boys and Jimmy Buffett during the summer and during the winter. And I, I always have to pepper in some Bruce Springsteen because he's my favorite artist. So I'm always seeing him over 30 times. So I'm always uh, having some Springsteen on I'm driving or just sit, lounging around the house as well. And now to the present. Nick, what have you been reading, watching, and or listening to? All right, let's see. Uh, reading, I've recently picked up from uh, Secret Headquarters over in Silver Lake, uh, in the Junction over there. Uh, this comic book called De The Department of Truth. You could say it's a graphic novel, really. It's a collection of, I think, six or seven, five. It's five issues now that I've, I have it in my hand. Uh, <laughs> but... um. It's it's cool, like a uh, conspiracy theory, weird thing. It's it kind of reminds me of the, uh, Grant Morrison's Invisibles. Uh, not that it measures up to that greatness, but um, but it's really cool. It's like this guy, for whatever reason, kind of gets nabbed by this secret organization, and they start telling him the fucking truth, and the and the truth is like like these different like conspiracies are real when like when people like when enough people believe it 
it becomes real and that's kind of the basis of the of the comic book and it kind of goes in and out of that it's got jfk on the cover jfk on the cover yeah there's a lot of lee harvey oz like it's like lee harvey oswald's still real and they like meet him down in the little lair like <laughs> it's like some shit like that you know what i mean it's cool it's fun um so that's what i've been reading um there's new issues of that coming out like the, i think the new graphic novel comes out in november so i'm gonna snag that too um watching so yeah i just watched uh lux eterna uh by gaspar noy it's his, uh his film from 2019 so does um does maybe climax come out after that i think climax came out before that okay so it is it's his most recent film so i just watched that yesterday um and i i uh i didn't know anything about it actually going into it so it's kind of cool it ties very much into this episode um the film is like it's it's uh charlotte gainsburg and beecher Dow like kind of backstage talking uh while they're on the set of a film and and the film and what they're talking about the entire time is about like the witch trials um so i again i didn't even know what it was about going into it yesterday knowing that we had this episode today so just strange coincidence there i've been like holding off watching it until a friend and i can watch it together and uh just coincidentally yesterday was the day that it went down so there you go synergy that's what they use in the corporate (laughs) corporate lingo synergy fuck yeah uh and listening i haven't been listening to a whole lot um i just kind of been running on autopilot uh, for listening lately, but I've been listening to a ton of, I have listened to that new, uh, West side gun, but mostly the, uh, the Rome streets track on there. And then I've been back to listening to, uh, Rome streets, death and the magician, a bunch. Um, but yeah, again, just kind of throwing that stuff on in the background and just like listening to books and stuff like that. Otherwise a little bit here and there. Uh, but yeah, that's about it for me, man. For me, read. I ain't been reading shit. Not. I really haven't had time. So I've been trying to write again, which is not one of the three components here. But like, I think I'm gonna start reading more so I can write again. I'm actually been talking about. I, I know we talked in the last episode about starting a cinematic void zine, which is gonna probably come and it's gonna be tied in with January Giallo. But I've been toying with doing like another like kind of personal zine, like collage art zine. Like I, I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, the thing I did called Chalk Outline, which has the the wonderful legendary Art Garfunkel saving her ass in Salem story. But kind of think about doing that kind of stuff again, because like I don't really have a creative outlet, but that's has nothing to do with reading. So why am I talking about it? Who the fuck knows? But the idea of writing gets me excited about reading. That's what I'm getting at. But for now, I'm not reading shit. Um, Watch-wise, um, I'm going to go through here real quick. Uh, last night, I watched Blood Blood for Dracula, the Paul Morrissey movie that was presented by Andrew, Andy Warhol with Udo Kier as Dracula. It's a fantastic, ridiculous fucking movie. I'm glad Severin got it out there. Um, Vinegar Syndrome is going to have the companion film, Flesh for Frankenstein, which is in 3D and all that good stuff. So Shit. stoked to have both of those. But rewatch Blood for Dracula has one of the most ridiculously awesome endings possible. If you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil it, but like, it's it's marvelous. Other things I've watched recently, I watched the one of my favorite, actually I'd say my favorite Godard movie, My Life to Live, Criterion Disc that I got. I think during the Criterion sale that was like this summer or whatever the fuck that was. Watched that again late night. I also recently watched The Green Knight, an A24 movie I actually really enjoyed. I know it gets it's getting a lot of hate, but like I, I knew going in it was going to be A, a slow burn. B, not a, like an action-packed like sword and stone type of movie. It's really good. It's really interesting. I really dug it. And I'm not the... I'm not a big A24 stan, but like when they make some good, you give them props. I think that's all I'm going to do for watch because I can't remember anything else I watched recently, but those those come to mind. Um, listen wise, I've been kind of all over the place because Iron Maiden put out a new record, which is called Senjutsu. It's a Japanese title. The last three tracks are over 30 minutes long. It's continuing the Maiden Prague long song thing they've been kind of starting since they've all kind of reunited with Brave New World. My personal favorite from this new era up until now has been A Matter of Life and Death, and I think 
this one is up there and might be better. It's definitely taking a lot of digestion because it's long and but there's not a lot of filler, even though it's long songs. There's maybe one track that I'm not really into, which probably be the track you're into because it deals with time machines. So go figure. <laughs> Sweet. Um, also, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, also, been listening to that um, new West Side Gun. Actually, when I was flying the Crypticon, I listened to it all the way through while I was on the plane. And yeah, I'm kind of don't hate it, don't love it, think it's good. Other things I've been listening to, I've been listening to that Boldy James, um, the Bo Jackson. They were calling it EP, but there's no way in fuck it's EP when it's over 40 minutes long. It's like 20 songs, 20 it, tracks, right? Yeah, and it's Maybe produced more like 12. I can't remember. <laughs> something like that. There's two, there's two bonus tracks, which were the singles that came out first. It's produced by Alchemist again. And I listened to it, really loved it. Kind of got cold on for a minute, but then I listened to it while flying to Seattle and like all on board again. It's really, really great. Also been listening to that um, Benny the Butcher Pyrex Picasso EP, which I guess he recorded like maybe two or three years ago and just dropped now. Another scorcher, like Benny's just been on fire, so it doesn't matter if it's old tracks, new shit, it's all been good. Mm -hmm. um, what else have I been listening to? I've been listening, oh, I've been listening to the um, Exhumed Information by the band Fulci, death metal band that you hit me to. Yeah. They have a, that new record's pretty good. I think there's some split tracks with a band called TV Crimes, which I'm pretty sure is like a member of Fulci's like electronic like side project thing. Not not 100 percent sure, but I think they're all somehow related. But really good death metal record. With that, we're gonna wrap up this episode of the Cinematic Void Podcast. Coming up, we're gonna have, be doing that much teased about Kayla Janice episode where we talk about her career and specifically her new awesome folk horror documentary. Woodland's Dark Days Bewitched, which coincidentally is going to come out right after I host the Beyond Fest screening of it. So really stoked to be able to present that as well as one of the folk horror movies that she curated for that awesome box set that Severn's putting out. Coming up, the next Cinemadness movie is going to be on Friday, October 15th. It is presented by our friends at Masker Video. And if you're on Patreon, we're doing a couple exclusive episodes of the Cinemadness movie. I think the first one is going to be coming up at the end of September, and then we're doing a Patreon-only Halloween special as well. So if you want to watch those, got to join that Void Patreon. But otherwise, coming up live for the Void is Beyond Fest, as we said, Woodlands Dark, Dave's Bewitched, Dr. Caligari Restoration, as well as Tombs of the Blind Dead. And so I'm really stoked to be presenting all that. So until next time, see, see you in the, the Void. void. Despite the horrifying past, witchcraft in Salem is alive and well and determined to survive.